How would a Nuchiha Yuzumaki hybrid fare in the world of Naruto? Ethan, a computer science student, transmigrates into the body of an orphan named Renjiro in Naruto. He soon realizes that the orphan has Uchiha and Uzumaki bloodlines. Join Renjiro in his journey as he grows in his quest to become the strongest shinobi. What's up guys? It's yo boy Omnisensei. Welcome to a new series, What If I Was Reborn in Naruto as Uchiha and Uzumaki Hybrid? Part 1 Like, Share, and Comment on the Video Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy! The noon sun cast a warm, golden hue on a village hidden by whirling tides in the land of whirlpools. The sun painted the wooden trees and other buildings in a soft ember glow. A gentle breeze rustled the leaves, creating a soothing symphony in the otherwise tranquil environment. But the tranquil environment betrayed the current situation. For it was far from tranquil, and was otherwise plunged into chaos. The discord between nature's harmony and human conflict was evident. Amidst the chaos, a poignant scene unfolded at the entrance of an alleyway. A man and a woman, both dressed in simple civilian attire, stood with a blend of sorrow and determination etched on their faces. The man's eyes held a mix of pride and melancholy, and his grip on the woman's hand was firm, as if to reassure her in the midst of turmoil. The two were Takashi and Sachi Uzumaki, with the woman formerly known as Sachi Uchiha. Both hailed from extraordinary clans even among all shinobi villages but contrary to expectations their lack of talent forced them into a mundane life. Beside them, a young Kunoichi, her onyx hair reflecting the vividness of the situation, clutched the hand of a young boy. The child's black eyes and red hair, innocent and wide, mirrored the uncertainty of the world around them. Dressed just like his parents, the child seemed too young to bear the weight of the situation, yet there was a hint of resilience in their gaze. Miwa, I know you said that Kanoha would send help but instead of us following you, young Renjiro would be enough. He would be of less burden for you. Sachi paused as she was trying her best to have hope in this dire situation. The village had already given any hope of receiving reinforcements from Kanoha, but she hadn't. More so she had grown up there, so she hoped that the Hidden Leaf would lend a hand to Yuzushio since their alliance had greatly benefited both parties. She continued, Take care, my young boy. We will come to see you soon. Be strong, Renjiro. Don't worry Sachi-chan, I will keep Renjiro safe until the situation stabilizes. Achiha Miwa tried her best to reassure her sister. She knew that no reinforcements were coming, but she could not tell her sister. She had been part of an Umbu team sent here by the Lord Hokage to send supplies to Yuzushio. That was all Kanoha could do since the other major villages had calculated their moves by keeping Kanoha spread thin defending the borders of the Land of Fire. When the mission was accomplished, she begged her team leader to let her talk to her sister in the village. Thankfully, her request was accepted, but it came at the cost of her team leaving her to find her way out of the village. She came to help her sister and her husband escape the impending doom about to fall Yuzushiogakure. But she didn't expect to find her sister already had a son. It had been close to six years since they last saw each other since her shinobi life had kept her busy. The fall of Yuzushiogakure was now but assured. They had managed to survive the siege for more than a month, but when the shinobi village's Jinchurikis acted, it was only a matter of time before they fell. She had tried to warn her sister but they decided that she should only leave with their son to give them a better shot of escaping. Both Takashi, Sachi and Miwa knew that this would probably be the last time they would see each other. Amidst the bittersweet farewells, a distant cacophony of deafening explosions grew ever louder. It was the haunting symphony of war, threatening to engulf the peaceful village. It's time Sachi, Miwa declared. The Kunoichi sighs darted anxiously towards the distance as the child wore a confused expression on his face. His head throbbed with pain, a relentless pounding that made him think his head would explode. But what added to the child's pain was the crushing weight of slight amnesia. He couldn't recall where he was or why he had been thrust into this situation. Where am I? Wasn't I just, wait, what was I doing before? Renjiro painfully lamented. Most crucially, he was plagued by the overwhelming uncertainty of not knowing who or what he truly was. As Miwa stood with Renjiro by her side, her senses, honed through years of training, suddenly came alive with an ominous premonition. Her eyes, which moments ago had been filled with determination, narrowed in a flash of instinct. 
With lightning quick reflexes, she snatched Renjiro's small body and in an instant, they flickered away. In their wake, the once quaint alleyway they had been standing in front of was now nothing but a chaotic mess of destruction. A deafening explosion had erupted with a force that also destroyed the neighboring buildings. Renjiro was left bewildered and frightened by the sudden movement. His wide, innocent eyes welled with tears as he looked back at the mess, and for a moment, he was in a storm of emotions he couldn't comprehend. And then, it happened. A searing pain tore through Renjiro's eyes. His hands clutched his face, and he let out a sharp, pained cry. This only added to the pain from his throbbing head. Miwa did not fail to sense the chakra fluctuations in Renjiro's body. Her face was gloomy as she was aware of what was happening to the young boy. She was quite surprised as this did not happen to Sachi, her sister, which forced her into the mundane life of a seamstress. Renjiro finally gave in to the pain and he lost consciousness. His body, overwhelmed by the pain and the sudden turmoil, went limp in Miwa's arms. In a pristine hospital room in the heart of Kanoha, Renjiro slowly stirred from his slumber. The searing pain that had once gripped his eyes and head had finally subsided, leaving behind a dull ache as a lingering reminder of the chaos he had witnessed. Sunlight filtered through the curtains, casting a warm, reassuring glow over the room. Renjiro's eyes blinked open and he found himself in an unfamiliar place. The hospital bed beneath him was pristine, and the crisp white sheets enveloped him in a cocoon of comfort. But it wasn't the room or the medical machinery that startled him. It was the sudden rush of memories, like a deluge of information flooding his mind. Damn it. I transmigrated. And into Naruto world of all places. But how? I don't even remember dying. Yeah, it's all fun and games watching the anime but when you think of what's to come the future seems bleak. Renjiro lamented. On Earth, he was known as Ethan Hunt. He was a devoted otaku, a connoisseur of all things anime and manga. He was a computer science major, so apart from coding and anime he really did not care for anything else. His world revolved around the vibrant characters, intricate storylines, and fantastical worlds that these forms of media offered. Ethan's room was adorned with posters of his favorite shows and shelves stacked high with manga volumes, each one read and reread countless times. He recalled the name Sachi, and the image of a loving couple, Sachi and Takashi. They were his parents or rather the original Renjiro's parents, and their faces materialized in his thoughts, bringing with them a profound sense of love and loss. I guess from now on I'll be Renjiro. What surname should I use? Achiha or Uzumaki? As the pieces of the puzzle fell into place, Renjiro understood that his parents, Sachi and Takashi, had both come from prominent shinobi lineages but had been forced into civilian life due to their lack of talent and decided to stay in Yuzushiogakure as shop owners. He tried to remember more of Renjiro's memories but besides the rudimentary information about his parents, he could not remember more which was weird but Renjiro decided to dwell on it. I'm half Uzumaki and half Achiha? Interesting I guess this makes it a bit easier. Wait now that I'm an orphan does that mean I'll go to an orphanage? This thought did not bore well with him. Not because of the lack of resources for self-improvement but due to no backing as he knew the moment he would show a speck of talent the root forces would come calling. Miwa Achiha walked with a sense of purpose through the bustling streets of Kanoha. Her thoughts were consumed by concern and curiosity as she made her way to Kanoha Hospital. The very idea that Renjiro, a half-breed Achiha, had awakened his Sharingan weighed heavily on her mind. It was no ordinary accomplishment, and Miwa couldn't shake the nagging feeling of unease. The Sharingan was a Kekiai Genkai, a powerful bloodline ability unique to the Achiha clan, and only a select few were lucky enough to unlock its potential. Fortunately, she was one of the select few to do so. Otherwise, she would not have attained the rank of Jounin that easily. The difference between a pureblood Uchiha and a half-breed lay in their stamina, in how long they could keep the Sharingan activated along with less chakra cost. For her and others of her lineage, it was a gift and a burden as it blossomed through tragedy. Miwa's heart was heavy with more than just concern for Renjiro. She also hoped that he would be fine, even as she grappled with her own worries. The escape from Yuzushiogakure had been nothing short of a harrowing ordeal. Being a Jounin, she had faced her share of challenges, but this journey had tested her to her limits. Miwa's daring escape from Yuzushiogakure was a testament to her skill and determination. She had navigated treacherous landscapes, outwitted enemy shinobi, and faced physical and emotional trials that had pushed her to the limit. They had to stop at the borders of the Land of Fire to seek reprieve from enemy shinobi pursuing them as well as receive medical attention for both her and Renjiro, with the latter needing a transfer to the hospital due to lack of medical need in the outpost. Miwa's arrival at the hospital was both an act of genuine concern for Renjiro and a quest to understand the enigma that had unfolded, a half-breed Uchiha who defied the very bloodline that had defined their clan for generations. 
She couldn't help but feel the boy would be unique. I will have to be his guardian. That's the least I could do for Sachi-chan's son. Especially now that Yuzushiogakure has fallen. When Miwa entered Renjiro's room, she was glad to find him awake from his coma but then surprised. Hmm? Did he become a retard? Miwa wondered because the red-headed boy was staring into the air as if he was dazed. Renjiro, are you okay? Miwa questioned. Just as Renjiro was thinking about his new life, he heard a voice, presumably talking to him. Following the sound, Renjiro saw a dark-haired woman. Her raven-black hair cascaded around her shoulders. Her eyes, similarly dark, seemed to bore deeply into one soul. The Kanoha headband, adorned with the village's iconic leaf emblem, was securely fastened around her forehead, a symbol of her unwavering loyalty to her village. The famous green flak jacket, a mark of a chunin and above rank in Kanoha, adorned her form above a black pair. Instead of the swirl representing the village it had a symbol uncanny to the Uchiha clan. As his eyes narrowed, Renjiro realized he could see a vague fog present in Miwa's body. The Sharingen. Miwa said, huh? Without even realizing it, Renjiro had been channeling chakra to his eyes instinctively. So that was the cause of that pain from my eye? It was a bit obvious. The vague fog must have been chakra. Heh. I guess I'll be known as Renjiro Uzumaki of the Sharingan. What is a Sharingan miss? Renjiro tried his best to feign ignorance. Whether he nailed the part or not, he wasn't sure. I guess Sachi really wanted to leave the shinobi world behind. Or maybe she never got a chance to educate him about his roots. It is the Kekiai Genkai of the Uchiha clan, which your mother was a part of. It is quite rare for someone as young as you to awaken. It is of great value to a shinobi. But enough about that, are you feeling okay? Um, I feel a little lightheaded since I just woke up minutes ago. But other than that, my body feels better than ever. It feels like I've grown stronger. Must be because his chakra has been unlocked. It can't be helped. With him awakening his Sharingan and unlocking his chakra, there is only one path that he could follow. Miwa thought. That is good to hear Renjiro. Should we head home then? Yes, I can't wait to meet mother and father, Renjiro replied gleefully. He was aware of the situation, but he still had a part to play. About that, Renjiro I have something to tell you. Miwa proceeded to inform Renjiro of the demise of his parents and the destruction of Yuzushiogakure. Miwa was worried about how mildly Renjiro's reaction to the news of his parents' demise was. In the end, she attributed it to Renjiro being in a state of shock. Meanwhile, Renjiro was deeply in his thoughts, I have a huge sword hanging down my neck with what's to come and considering I'm here after the fall of the Uzumaki clan I will have to participate in a shinobi war or two as it wasn't explicitly stated when Yuzushiogakure was destroyed. I have to hit the ground running as soon as possible. Renjiro told Miwa that he felt better and did not feel like staying in the hospital any longer. Miwa headed to see whether he could get a medical need to discharge Renjiro. Before heading out he handed Renjiro some clothes branded with the Uchiha clan symbol to wear. I am not technically an Uchiha but since I'm an orphan, I just have to find a place to settle in. Renjiro surmised as he changed his clothes. After an hour or so, they were able to finish up with the hospital since Renjiro was fine. Miwa guided Renjiro through the winding streets of Kanoha, eventually arriving at the destination of the Uchiha clan compound. Renjiro was completely enamored by it. The compound was a place steeped in history and tradition, with towering stone structures and lush gardens that whispered tales of generations past. Upon entering the clan's heart, they passed the ancestral shrine, where flickering candles paid homage to the clan's forebears. At the end of the path, they came to a grand hall. Here, seated regally and with an unmistakable presence, was Daichi Uchiha, the current Uchiha clan head. Daichi's eyes, dark and piercing, held a wisdom that could only be gained through years of experience and leadership. As Renjiro and Miwa entered the hall, Daichi's gaze shifted from the scrolls he had been studying to the newcomers. Miwa-chan, you have finally arrived. This must be Sachi's boy Renjiro. Daichi said in a regal tone. I am deeply saddened by what happened to your parents, especially your mother. She was a dear childhood friend to my wife. But let me not darken the mood. I hear that you have awakened your Sharingan is that right? Yes. I have, Renjiro responded. That just shows how talented you are. Welcome to the Uchiha clan. I hear that you go by your father's name you can choose to carry on the Uzumaki or adopt your maternal one. Daichi's words were measured and filled with significance before continuing, so which one would it be? So which one would it be? Daichi asked. I will stick to Renjiro Uzumaki. It is the only thing I have left reminding me of my parents. Renjiro replied without hesitation. Renjiro had already thought of this beforehand and he was prepared to stick to his decision. 
He had weighed out the pros and cons of both options. The Uchiha clan could provide a lot of things for the current him that could help him grow quickly in both power and influence. To Renjiro, the most important thing the clan could offer was their backing. It would provide a blanket against someone who Renjiro thought was a menace to society. The person in question was none other than Shimura Danzo. The Uchiha clan could be a bulwark for Renjiro as Danzo would undoubtedly want to recruit him to the root especially now that he had awakened his Sharingan. Just imagine an Uzumaki who could use the Sharingan, even Renjiro was scared of his potential. But inasmuch as it could bring boons to Renjiro, it was not enough to move him. With his potential, it was inevitable to cross paths with Danzo and only his personal strength would be enough to act as a deterrent. Besides, Renjiro did not like to be tied down and taking up the Uchiha name would be exactly doing that. With all the drama and clan politics in the village regarding the Uchiha, it sickened him and he wanted no part in it. There was no point in taking up the name and then discarding it later when he was strong enough. Although it was a huge gamble, Renjiro decided to take the risk as he hoped he would get the Sasuke treatment after the Uchiha massacre. You have strong resolve Renjiro, Daichi remarked. Still, I must find a way to tie him to the clan, his Uzumaki abilities could be useful for the clan later. Daichi thought. In truth, Daichi was testing Renjiro. He wanted to know what kind of person Renjiro was, and his answer just proved it to him. Although this was not quite the preferred outcome, Daichi decided to give Renjiro some time and monitor him. After all, his top priority was to ensure all Sharingans were still within the clan. I will have to ask someone to join Miwa in helping you settle, as they were heading out, Daichi held back Miwa for a minute while Renjiro was out of the hall waiting for the help they were to receive. Miwa and Daichi finished just in time as their help arrived. To his surprise, it was none other than a young Fugaku who seemed to be in his late teens. After a few final arrangements, Renjiro Uchiha was provided with accommodation where he would live alone. This was a total surprise to Renjiro as he assumed that he would stay with Miwa since they related. This wasn't feasible due to the nature of her work as a jounin, which made her occupied with missions. His living quarters consisted of a traditional, one-room apartment on the upper floors of one of the well-maintained Uchiha clan buildings. The space was compact but comfortable, furnished with the essentials. The walls were constructed of sturdy wood, polished to a warm, inviting sheen. The wooden floorboards were smooth and meticulously maintained, adding to the overall sense of tidiness. A simple, low table sat in the center of the room, flanked by a pair of cushions for seating. Shoji screens separated his sleeping area from the rest of the room. A door led to a small, open balcony that offered a view of the Uchiha clan's training grounds and the distant rooftops of the Hidden Leaf Village. The sleeping area featured a futon and a low, elegant wooden cabinet. The cabinet provided storage space for clothing and personal belongings. The compact kitchen area included a stove, a wash basin, and a low counter with a few basic utensils and cookware. A door could be pulled to separate the kitchen from the main living space. Although the accommodations were simple, they bore the hallmarks of the Uchiha clan's disciplined lifestyle and attention to detail. From his chats with Miwa, as she escorted him to his new residence, Renjiro concluded that he was born immediately after the Second Shinobi War. The Hokage rock he saw with only three heads simply cemented this. Well, that's good. This should make me a couple of years older than Kakashi. At least I have a decade or two to become strong and survive Itachi and Abito's slaughterfest. He hoped to be stronger to, at the very least, alter the timeline events to a more favorable future. But he also had to be realistic as Itachi and Abito killed older, skilled Jounins. First things first, I need to make a plan of action before I join the academy, he had around a year before he could get enrolled to the academy. He wanted to catch up to his peers as the original Renjiro's chakra was only unlocked and he had not undergone any sort of training. I should probably focus on training my body and chakra. I should also try to train my Sharingan to improve it to the second and third tomos. Renjiro had already thought of Fuinjutsu but he decided to put that on hold until he was in the academy. He had figured out that since he got the Sharingan from his maternal side, he would at least get something from his paternal side. There is no need having large chakra reserves and not be in full control of them. Once I get a solid foundation of those two, I can focus on the Sharingan and maybe start on my ninjutsu training. I also need to visit the clan's library, and also the villages, and see if there is some useful technique for me. I also need to get a taijutsu technique. Too many things to do, too little time. Rinjiro sighed as he retired to his bed for the night. He knew he had a long day ahead of him the following day. In the Hokage's office, a room adorned with shelves of scrolls, ceremonial weapons, and the Hokage's iconic hat, Hiruzen Sarutobi sat behind his imposing wooden desk. 
The room was dimly lit, the soft glow of lantern light casting long shadows across the aged Hokage's face. The third Hokage, a middle-aged man with a deeply lined visage, bore the weight of his responsibilities with a mix of wisdom and determination. It had been a long and tiring day, plagued by concerns over Iwagakure's activities in Kusagakure, the village hidden in the grass. The village's actions had given him many sleepless nights, and he knew that the task of maintaining peace and balance in and out of Kanoha was a relentless one. In this moment of solitude, a masked Umbu shinobi materialized out of the shadows. The mask concealed the Umbu's identity, leaving only their calculating eyes visible. With a precise and silent grace, the Umbu handed Hiruzen Sarutobi a sealed scroll. Hiruzen's fingers, calloused from years of leadership and jutsu, delicately unfurled the scroll, revealing its contents. As his eyes scanned the written words, a hint of recognition and perhaps a touch of amusement crossed his face. He muttered under his breath, so Daichi wants to integrate him into the clan. No pain, no gain. Renjiro clung onto that phrase to enable him to complete his workout. He already had decided on a workout plan. He would be doing a hundred push-ups, pull-ups, and squats. He would also run laps around his yard. He did not have any way of measuring the distance but by his approximation, one lap around his yard was around a hundred meters so a hundred of such laps would result in 10 kilometers, 6.21 miles. Rinjiro knew that starting this from the get-go was a tall order. He opted to start with a fraction of the numbers and then gradually increase the reps and sets. Rinjiro took a break since he was spent after the workout. It was now time for his chakra control training. Early on in the series, the concept of chakra control is introduced through the training exercises. Leaf balancing, tree climbing and water walking become the foundation for building precise chakra control. These exercises require shinobi to employ a precise amount of chakra to hold the leaf in place and use their chakra to scale trees without their hands and to tread on the water surface. Renjiro concluded that the criteria for a solid foundation in chakra control was having mastery in all three exercises. He was about to begin with the leaf balancing exercise. Renjiro had already visited both libraries and already gotten basic information on the exercises. The deceptively simple yet challenging task focuses on enhancing a ninja's precise control over their chakra. Its objective is to stick a single leaf, usually a dry, fragile leaf, on a specific part of the body, often the forehead or the tip of the nose, using nothing but chakra. The leaf should remain in place without falling. Easy right? Wrong. The troubling part is the mental focus required. Successfully balancing the leaf requires intense concentration and focus. The ninja must channel their chakra with unwavering intent and maintain that concentration to prevent the leaf from falling. Under the shade of a towering tree, Renjiro sought a moment of stillness. Seated in the traditional cross-legged position, Renjiro closed his eyes and began to calm the turbulence of his thoughts. All his worries vanished, replaced by a singular focus on the present moment. With each measured breath, his mind settled into a state of serene clarity. He visualized the turmoil dissipating like ripples on a pond, leaving only the core of his being. In the palm of his hand, he held a fragile leaf. With a few slow breaths in and out, he channeled his focus onto the leaf, his fingers brushing against its surface with a gentle touch. Then, with deliberate care, Renjiro raised the leaf to the center of his forehead. It quivered against his skin. He felt the connection between his chakra and the leaf a subtle dialogue between energy and life. Renjiro concentrated his chakra on that precise spot, the very center of his forehead, and he felt the subtle movement of his energy. The chakra flowed, guided by his intent and purpose. Within moments, the leaf, which had once teetered on the precipice of his skin, adhered firmly to his forehead. The achievement filled him with a sense of satisfaction and accomplishment. He had harnessed his chakra, channeled it and achieved the desired result. However, Renjiro's elation was short-lived. As he repeated the process again and again, the leaf's adherence became inconsistent. It's like I'm getting worse with every try. Frustration set in, overshadowing his earlier success. What frustrated Renjiro even more was that he was losing significant amounts of chakra in the process. Calm down Etha, no calm down Renjiro. It's called the leaf concentration exercise. You can't be calm and concentrate if you are frustrated. Renjiro tried to calm himself down. The first thing he had read from the books was that chakra control, like life itself, required balance and mastery. Unfortunately, things did not get better as the only improvement Renjiro saw after an hour was his frustration levels. He was wrestling with the delicate art of chakra control, and it was proving to be a formidable opponent. Damn it! What am I doing wrong? Renjiro racked his brain but he could not find a solution to his problem. Exhausted and disheartened, Renjiro rose from his spot under the tree and dusted himself off. With a deep sigh, he made his way to Miwa's place. 
It hurt his ego but he was not dumb enough to realize when he needed help. Renjiro approached the entrance. As he knocked then pushed open the doors and stepped inside, he was met with Miwa was seated on a tatami mat. Renjiro, she acknowledged with a nod, how can I help you? Renjiro settled opposite Miwa. Miwa-sama, I. I've been trying to master chakra control, but it's more challenging than I imagined. I succeeded at first, or I think I did. After repeating the process, I've been losing chakra. I can't seem to achieve it. Miwa regarded him with a measured, understanding gaze. Show me exactly what you were doing. Miwa urged Renjiro Renjiro obliged and did as he was told. Just like his previous attempts, Renjiro failed. Miwa noticed his frustration. It is good that you have taken the first step by seeking help. Chakra control is as much about self-discovery as it is about technique. Miwa paused to let the words sink in. Do you know why the exercise is performed on the forehead and not any other part of the body? Is it because it is near to our brains? If we can attain control of the chakra near our brains it will be easier. Close enough. It is because of something called Tenketsu. It can be simplified to a hole where our body releases chakra. There is one on your forehead. If you can control the chakra released from there then your overall chakra control increases. Oh. Those are the points that the Byakugan reveals to Hugas. But if people know this why aren't there techniques that help people fully increase the output of these points? So how do it do it? Renjiro asked. First try meditation then just release chakra not from your whole forehead but from that Tenketsu alone. Renjiro followed her instructions, closing his eyes and breathing in, then out, slowly and deliberately. Let go of your frustration, Miwa continued in a soothing tone. In meditation, you'll find the clarity and mental discipline you seek. Your chakra is a part of you, and you must learn to flow with it, not against it. It did not take long for Renjiro to form a connection with his chakra. He then focused on his head and tried to release it. It was hard at first, but after a few more attempts Renjiro got a hang of it. It was akin to consciously choosing to breathe with your mouth instead of your nose. Once you get a hang of it, you could even switch between the two in a heartbeat. With enough chakra being released a weak grip was established and the leaf finally stuck on Renjiro's forehead. That's what I am talking about. Renjiro was happy to finally do it. Now he just had to keep this up for as long as he could. Was it this easy? Renjiro thought the exercise was easy and wondered why many characters struggled with it. That's when he realized the main objective of the exercise. You had to hold the leaf in position for as long as possible to better your control. It was just like breathing exercises in vocal practice. The more you exhale and inhale at controlled rates, the more you can hold the sound. In this case, if you regulate the chakra output, your control increases. But prolonging the time the leaf sticks on your forehead was like continuously exhaling, and that was the ultimate test. Miwa noticed Renjiro's action and timed him. She was surprised at how long he could concentrate on the exercise. More than half a minute. Good work Renjiro. This is a great result for your first try. Thanks, Miwa-sama, this was all because you guided me. Don't worry, whenever you are stuck I will always try my best to help. Overall Renjiro was elated since he was an overachiever in his past life, so he was always used to things coming quickly to him with less effort applied. But things were different here, evidently, as with the leaf balancing exercise. Renjiro did not let this get into his head though. He was painfully aware of how this was just the first step in a long journey ahead. Renjiro was glad Miwa helped him as he underwent a huge breakthrough. It also helped him warm up a bit towards Miwa. Miwa of course, noticed this and reveled in it. After having a majority of his chakra-based questions answered by Miwa, Renjiro headed back to his room. The mental fatigue he had could not allow him to continue with the chakra control techniques or his physical condition. What to do next? In the past week, Miwa had taken Renjiro around the clan compound and also to major parts of the village like the Hokage Monument in the Hokage Mountain, and some other tourist destinations. Of course, the destination where they spent most of their time was the public playground. It seemed that Miwa wanted Renjiro to have a normal childhood and make friends in the village. It did not quite work out how Miwa wanted, but she still hoped that when the boy would enroll to the academy he would make bonds with other children in the village. Let's go and find something to eat. Even in his past life, Renjiro had been a terrible cook and transmigrating did not change that. So for his own sake, he would either eat out or at Miwa's place. Renjiro preferred the former since the latter depleted his social battery. Since he also wanted to take a break before going to the library for research later in the afternoon, eating was the best opportunity he could get. Why did I have to come to an earlier timeline in Naruto? The ramen could really at this time. Renjiro murmured as he snapped his chopsticks apart. Since Tuchi had yet to his Ichiraku ramen shop, 
Renjiro had his meal at some restaurant that mainly served grilled meat dishes and other variations. Good thing it is only a couple of years till he opens it. Renjiro consoled himself as he savored his meal. The only reason that he did not enjoy the place was that the dishes that they were offering were too heavy for him, especially since he was still training. Other than that, it was still acceptable. Having nothing else to do, Renjiro decided to head to the clan library. His top priority, besides chakra control exercises and physical conditioning, was to get a basic taijutsu technique and find ways how he could improve his Sharingan. As Renjiro entered the library, he was met with the hushed reverence that permeated the air. The shelves were meticulously divided into sections, each tailored to a different level of proficiency, Jenin, Chunin, Jonin, and other forbidden zones. He was not even an academy student, at least not yet, so the knowledge he could access was limited. Renjiro's gaze swept across the library, searching for the knowledge that would help him advance his Sharingan. Unfortunately, all that was waiting for him was disappointment. As what he was searching for remained elusive. The Uchiha had long held their dojitsu close to their hearts, guarding it from prying eyes and potential enemies. Such invaluable knowledge was not casually written down, for fear that it might fall into the wrong hands. Instead, the methods and techniques for training the Sharingan were passed down through word of mouth, from mentor to pupil, in the crucible of training and experience. This sucks. I was hoping that I could do this on my own, but it seems I have no other option but to rely on Miwa again. Renjiro lamented. He did not like to depend on others. But his current circumstances could not allow him to do as he pleases. Hope I do get a taijutsu technique. It would greatly help in my workouts. Renjiro moved to the taijutsu section of the library. Most of the information available to him was the basic taijutsu used in the academy and the one used by the clan. The taijutsu technique was called the interceptor fist. This was something that Renjiro did not remember from the anime. It only made sense that since they had their own signature ninjutsu and jinjutsu they would also have their own signature taijutsu. I remember Sasuke copying Rock Lee's moves I just thought that they used their Sharingan to copy their opponent's moves and integrate them into their fighting style. After getting the technique, he moved to the ninjutsu section of the library. Most of the jutsus there were E-ranked with a majority of them being of fire chakra nature. No surprise. Hmm let me see, the fireball jutsu that Fugaku taught his sons isn't here. I guess he wouldn't teach them a weak jutsu. Renjiro was disappointed that the jutsus present were not up to par. But considering they were E-rank, it was expected. He was only looking at the jutsu section due to curiosity. But what I can access now is limited. I am sure I will have access to better jutsus. Renjiro did not want to start practicing ninjutsu just yet. Renjiro wanted to spend the next three months or more with his current training plan to build a good foundation or, at least, a semblance of it. Plus, it was evident that his chakra control was not at an acceptable level. Yet, as Renjiro was about to exit the library, his sharp and observant eyes caught a peculiar scene unfolding at the library help desk. A young Uchiha, undoubtedly a genin or an academy student, stood there engaged in conversation with the librarian. In the librarian's outstretched hand, a delicate piece of paper rested, a fragment of parchment that intrigued Renjiro. This paper, although seemingly ordinary at first glance, exuded an air of intrigue that couldn't escape his keen perception. Renjiro paused for a moment, his Sharingan's perceptive gaze capturing every detail. The color of the paper was fascinating. At first glance, it appeared to be pristine ivory. However, upon closer examination, Renjiro detected subtle streaks of light blue woven intricately into the fibers, resembling veins of chakra subtly infused within. Renjiro couldn't help but recognize it with a sense of certainty. This was no ordinary piece of parchment. Is that a chakra paper? It definitely is. Renjiro decided to follow the young Uchiha ninja who had requested it. He approached the library help desk and addressed the librarian with a quiet but determined tone. Excuse me, he began, I'd like to request a piece of that paper, please. The chakra paper? The librarian asked. I was right. Renjiro thought as he nodded. The librarian reached out for a fresh sheet of chakra paper, recognizing Renjiro as another member of the clan despite being taken aback by his crimson hair. She handed it to him, and Renjiro accepted it with a gracious nod of thanks. However, unlike the young Uchiha he had observed earlier, Renjiro had a different intention. I'll use this when I get home, he decided. He wanted to ensure that the information regarding his elemental affinity remained confidential, known only to him. At the very least, he wanted to control what he allowed others to know and what he could keep to himself. Renjiro knew that even such details about him could lead to his demise at the enemy's hands. Imagine if they were only prepared to counter his fire release then he uses water release. It never hurt having another ace up your sleeve. 
As Renjiro arrived at his home, he was filled with anticipation. Inside the confines of his room, he set the chakra paper on a small, unassuming table. What were the results again? Crumpling up means lightning, getting damp means water, splitting into two means wind, burning up means fire and turning into dirt and crumbling away means earth. With a deep breath, Renjiro focused his chakra, allowing it to flow from his being into the paper. Renjiro watched with bated breath as the chakra paper, which had absorbed his chakra, began to respond to his inner energy. To his surprise, the paper exhibited quite a dramatic transformation. It first, split neatly in half. Then, in a sudden burst of intensity, the paper ignited, the flames consuming it until nothing remained but a pile of fine, delicate ashes. What the hell? Ever since Ethan realized he was in the world of Naruto, he had fantasies of jutsus he could master and the power he could hold. The basis of this self-wrought fantasy laid in his chakra nature affinity. Rinjiro's heart was filled with anticipation as he contemplated the elemental affinity he hoped to discover. He weighed the pros and cons of each option carefully. Fire release, or katan, was known for its raw offensive power. It was strong against wind but weak against water. Water release, or suetun, was versatile, allowing both offense and defense making it strong against fire but vulnerable to earth release. Wind release, or futon, excelled in speed and precision, though it lacked the brute force of fire. It was strong against lightning but weak against fire. Earth release, or doton, provided strong defense and resilience but was relatively slow. Lightning release, or raitun, was speedy and precise, effective in close combat but vulnerable to earth-based defenses. Rinjiro's desires leaned toward lightning release, but he remained open to the outcome of the chakra paper test. He was half-expectedly waiting for a fire nature due to his Uchiha lineage. What does this mean? Does it mean I have two chakra natures? Maybe that was the amalgamation of both results. Fire and wind huh, can't say I'm disappointed. They are both good natures. At the very least, I'll be fast and pack a punch. In one of the training grounds assigned to the Uchiha clan, Miwa and Renjiro faced each other in a friendly spar. Both had activated their Sharingan, the Tomos in their crimson eyes spinning with anticipation. One with three Tomo while the other had two. Their footsteps were light as they circled one another, ready to engage. Renjiro made the first move, darting forward with impressive speed. His Sharingan allowed him to anticipate Miwa's movements. He delivered a swift and precise strike, aiming a punch at her side. Miwa, who was more equally swift and perceptive, dodged the attack with a graceful step to the side. She countered by launching a rapid series of kicks, aiming for Renjiro's legs. Renjiro's Sharingan allowed him to track her movements with precision. He blocked her kicks with his forearms, showing off his agility and quick reflexes. As he deflected her strikes, Renjiro seized the opportunity to perform a high-speed rotation, unleashing a powerful kick that sent a gust of wind towards Miwa. He's getting faster, Miwa thought as she prepared to counter the coming attack. Miwa used her Sharingan to read Renjiro's intentions. She swiftly activated her own ninjutsu, releasing a burst of wind from her hands to counter his attack. The two attacks collided, creating a swirling vortex that disrupted the courtyard's tranquility. The spar continued with rapid exchanges of blows, each combatant utilizing their Sharingan to predict and counter the other's movements. The intensity of the battle demonstrated their mastery of taijutsu and their exceptional control over chakra, making it a spectacle of finesse and power. As they fought, Renjiro decided to incorporate a ninjutsu technique. He focused his chakra and, with remarkable speed, released a barrage of shuriken towards Miwa. His Sharingan allowed him to guide the projectiles with a somewhat unparalleled accuracy. Miwa, however, was no stranger to ninjutsu herself. She used her Sharingan to track the incoming shuriken and deftly deflected them with a well-timed burst of wind. The shuriken scattered harmlessly, leaving Miwa unscathed. Their spar continued with ferocity, with Miwa pushing Renjiro's limits. Their Sharingan eyes blazed with determination as they showcased the power and finesse of the Uchiha clan. Breathing heavily, Renjiro slowed to a stop, sweat glistening on his brow as he took a moment to catch his breath. Across from him, Miwa lowered her stance, her Sharingan still active, a hint of a victorious smile on her lips. Are you already tired? Miwa taunted him. But Renjiro was too tired to pay attention to her. Renjiro's chest rose and fell with each labored breath, and as he stood there, he couldn't help but reflect on how far he had come. Just seven months ago, he had embarked on a journey of arduous training, knowing that he was behind compared to some of his Uchiha peers who had started training when they were much younger. He recalled the days when he struggled with even the most basic jutsu and the early mornings of physical conditioning that had left him sore and fatigued. The memory of countless hours spent in the clan library, poring over scrolls, was still fresh in his mind. 
Miwa, who had always been a source of inspiration and support, had played a pivotal role in his training. She had helped him harness the power of his Sharingan, refine his Taijutsu, and guide him in mastering the basics of his Ninjutsu. As Renjiro looked at her, he realized that while today's spar had ended in her favor, he had made remarkable progress. Renjiro's journey was far from over, and he knew that he had much more to learn and achieve. But in this moment of reflection, he felt a sense of pride in how he had embraced the path of a ninja, and he was determined to continue his training. Renjiro had made a habit of train till he exhausted his reserves, meditating and then repeating the whole process. Since his personal experience with chakra helped him conclude that it was similar to muscle, he decided that he would deplete his reserves and then end his day by meditating. This worked out for him since his reserves saw an increase of about 50% coupled with his growing body, Renjiro was sure that he would have a healthy amount of chakra to work with. After Renjiro had reached a satisfactory level for his foundation, he moved to his Sharingan and Ninjutsu. Renjiro found out that the only effective way to improve his Sharingan was to practice the Shuriken Jutsu with it. This enabled him to improve his eyes and he awakened the second Tomo, which he had achieved quite recently. It definitely surprised Renjiro at how easy it was awakening the second Tomo. Maybe I am just talented. But how do I even get my Mangekyo? I am an orphan. Will Miwa's eyes work? Does she even have a Mangekyo already? What am I even thinking? If Mangekyos are that easy to obtain, it would have made the Uchihas more busted than they already were. Renjiro surmised. In regards to ninjutsu, Miwa had been giving him pointers, which also helped in that Renjiro managed to finally learn the Uchiha signature jutsu, the Great Fireball Jutsu. This was no mere feat as it was a C-rank jutsu. Renjiro also had numerous similar spars with Miwa whenever she was free which allowed him to hone his skills and gain battle experience. This was important as there was a significant difference between practicing a move in training and executing it in the field. With all this Renjiro felt equipped enough for the Ninja Academy, of which admission was right around the corner. As the sun began its descent beyond the horizon, casting a warm, golden hue over the village hidden in the leaves, Miwa and Renjiro found themselves seated at a renowned restaurant in Kanoha. The restaurant was a cozy and inviting establishment, its entrance adorned with a wooden sign that proudly displayed the name, Kaitiki Grills, in bold characters. The scent of simmering broth and sizzling ingredients wafted through the air, enveloping the vicinity in a tantalizing aroma. The interior of Kaitiki Grills was a delightful blend of traditional and modern design. Warm wooden beams crisscrossed the ceiling, giving the space a rustic charm. Sturdy wooden tables and benches, aged with character, filled the dining area. Sunlight filtered through paper lanterns that cast a soft, ambient glow, creating an atmosphere of warmth and comfort. As they sat at their table, Renjiro and Miwa were greeted by the restaurant's friendly staff which was a mother and son pair, known for their warm and welcoming service. The menu, filled with a variety of grilled food options, was presented with a flourish. The room buzzed with activity, with other customers chatting and enjoying their meals. The sound of bubbling broth, clinking chopsticks, and cheerful laughter filled the air, creating a harmonious symphony of camaraderie and delight. Miwa, while savoring her meal, turned her Sharingan embellished gaze toward Renjiro. With a warm and encouraging smile, she asked, Renjiro, are you feeling ready for the academy enrollment tomorrow? Renjiro considered her question, his thoughts mingling with the savory flavors of the meal. He took a moment to swallow his food and replied, I've come a long way in these past seven months, thanks to your guidance and training. I feel prepared. Miwa's smile widened, a mixture of pride and support in her eyes. That's the spirit, Renjiro. You've shown incredible dedication and growth during our training, and I have no doubt that you'll excel at the academy. You should also know you won't be heading to the academy alone. You'll have two other brothers from our clan joining you. Renjiro raised an eyebrow, a mix of curiosity and surprise crossing his face. Brothers? Who are they? Damn, they sure take these clan relations too seriously. Renjiro mused. He was shocked when he realized that most clans in Kanoha consider themselves one big happy family. Except for the Hyuga, for obvious reasons. Miwa chuckled softly, taking a sip of her tea. You'll meet them tomorrow, just before we leave for the academy. It's a Uchiha tradition to support and encourage one another. Renjiro nodded in understanding but couldn't hide a trace of his own curiosity. I've been more of a shut-in since I came here and haven't really made an effort to know other Uchiha my age. Mainly because apart from Fugaku, there really isn't any Uchiha from this time that was mentioned in the story, hopefully, they'll impress me. In the bustling courtyard of the academy was a sea of eager children and their families. Academy instructor Hiroshi Nagatomo stood in a room watching them. He knew that today marked the beginning of an important journey for the young ninjas to be. 
To his side, his assistant, Emi, had been keeping track of the arrivals. Hiroshi turned to Emi and inquired, Emi, how many children have come for the academy enrollment this time? Emi consulted her clipboard, her eyes scanning the crowd, and replied, It looks like we have a sizable group, Hiroshi. I've counted over 1500 children so far, and there may still be a few more straggling in. I just hope we get a good picking, the last shinobi war caused us a lot of good ninjas. Early in the morning, Renjiro arrived at the designated meeting point to join the other two Uchiha enrolling at the academy. He was dressed in all black. He was not wearing any clothes with the clan symbol which made their designated chaperone raise a brow. It would be strange for a child to introduce themselves as an Uzumaki and still wear Uchiha clan clothes. As he approached, he noticed Kaido and Sora Uchiha, the young siblings he had informed of the previous day. Kaido was a six-year-old with the distinct Uchiha traits. He had raven black hair that was neatly combed, and his onyx eyes held a determined gaze. He wore the traditional Uchiha attire, a dark shirt adorned with the clan symbol on the back. A sense of seriousness and purpose radiated from him. Sara, at five years old, was a year younger than both Renjiro and her brother, but she displayed the same striking Uchiha features. Her hair, also jet black, was pulled into a neat ponytail, and her eyes held the same enigmatic depth that marked their clan. She wore a smaller version of the Uchiha attire. From their first interactions, Renjiro thought they were a bit dismissive of him but he didn't dwell on that. Frankly, he did not care at all. Why would the silly thoughts of six-year-olds bother him? Together with their chaperone, the three young Uchiha made their way to the academy, where a large group of children had already gathered. The instructors had devised a test to assess the candidates and filter the enrollment to a more manageable number. The fitness assessment involved a series of physical challenges designed to evaluate the children's agility, endurance, and overall physical condition. Tasks included timed sprints and an obstacle course. The second assessment aimed to determine whether the children had unlocked their chakra. To pass this test, candidates had to demonstrate their ability to mold and release a small amount of chakra, typically by creating a visible burst of energy. Good luck and make the clan proud. Their chaperone, a young man, said to the three kids. The young man, who Renjiro guessed was a Chunin, went to the stands to see the children's performance. He still had to make a report of their performance to the clan later. As the assessment began, it became evident that not all the candidates met the criteria. Some lacked the physical fitness and agility required, while others struggled to unlock their chakra. The girl seems to be the type who is calm and collected while her brother is the total opposite, the contrast makes them an interesting pair. Renjiro had been observant throughout the whole assessment. He had noticed all other clan and civilian children who were participating to make a mental note of anyone he should pay attention to. There was not anyone who caught his eye apart from a civilian girl who was able to keep up even with children from ninja clans. With the training he had undergone the last seven months, the assessments were a walkthrough for him. With each task, the number of participants dwindled. The obstacle course proved challenging for many, and the chakranlocking test left some frustrated as they couldn't produce the required burst of energy. In the end, the instructors managed to narrow down the group to a more manageable number of students who had passed both the fitness and chakra assessments. The result was that almost half of the number of kids had managed to meet the required criteria. Even with this, that was still a significant number. Hence, the kids were divided into different batches according to their results. Renjiro and the siblings managed to make it to the elite batch, which was not that surprising at all. There were other clan children who also made it to the elite batch with only a handful of civilian children. As the assessments drew to a close, an academy instructor stepped forward with a stack of academy identification cards. The children, including Renjiro, Kaido, and Sora Uchiha, gathered around in a cluster. With a tone of encouragement, the instructor began distributing the identification cards, one by one. Each card was a tangible representation of their acceptance into the academy and the first formal step in their training as future shinobi. The cards were made of durable material, bearing the emblem of the Hidden Leaf Village and the academy's logo. On the front, the student's name and photograph were displayed, making it a personal and treasured possession. Before the enrollment, they had registered their details way before. With this Renjiro was officially an academy student. On the first day of the academy, Fellow aspiring ninjas stepped into a spacious and well-kept classroom that was designed to inspire learning and growth. The room was rectangular, with large windows on one side that allowed natural light to flood in, brightening the space. The sunlight filtered through the glass, casting warm, golden hues that danced across the rows of desks and the floor. The desks were arranged in neat rows, each equipped with a comfortable chair. 
The walls of the classroom were adorned with educational posters, charts, and ninja-themed artwork, all serving to inspire and educate the students. The overall ambience of the classroom was one of eager anticipation. Excited chatter filled the air as students greeted old friends and made new ones. As instructor Ruji Mataka entered the room, his presence commanded the attention of the eager young students. He wore a traditional ninja outfit, the symbol of Hidden Leaf Village proudly displayed on his flak jacket. Good morning, class. I'm instructor Ruji Mataka, and I'm thrilled to be your guide on this journey of learning and discovery. Today marks the beginning of your path to becoming skilled shinobi. Let's start with introductions, shall we? Please, one by one, tell us your name and your aspirations. Where shall we start from? How about you at the front? And with that, all the kids started introducing themselves along with their ambitions. Renjiro took his time to understand the composition of the class. The elite batch had 30 students. There were three Achiha, two Hyuga, two each from Nara, and Yamanaka, three Inazuka, one Aburame, one each from Sarutobi, Shimura, Kato and Hitaki clans, and surprisingly three from Senju and two from Kurama clans. The other eight were normal civilians. Aiko Nakamura, the civilian girl who had impressed Renjiro during the academy assessment, was also among this group. Wait, why is the class quiet? Has Dash, the boy at the back. Please introduce yourself. Ruji's voice brought Renjiro out of his reverie. Only then did Renjiro notice that almost all pairs of eyes were on him. Renjiro promptly stood up and introduced himself, My name is Uzumaki Renjiro. Uzumaki? Is that a clan in the village? The minute Renjiro introduced himself, a wave of murmurs swept the class. It was understandable as very few kids were aware of the clan and what happened to them. And what are your aspirations Renjiro, just as Renjiro was sitting down, Ryujin inquired. Um, I want to get strong enough to protect what's important to me. This was the first thing that came to Renjiro's mind. He was being honest because he knew how powerful the beings that would put the whole world at risk were. That's a good aspiration Renjiro, Ryujin said. My name is Achiha Kaido and... Good thing is I have decades to prepare for the last war. But to get there, I first need to survive. Instructor Ruji Mataka, after listening to the aspirations of his students, stood at the front of the classroom with a solemn expression. He cleared his throat and began to address the young ninja aspirants. I'm truly impressed by the determination and dreams you've shared today. Each of you carries the potential to become an outstanding shinobi and uphold the honor of the Hidden Leaf Village. As the elite batch of this year, there are high expectations from our village because of the remarkable potential I see in this room. So don't disappoint the village. Okay? After a brief pep talk, the class was led on a tour of the Hidden Leaf Village Academy. The tour began in the heart of the academy building. As they moved through the hallways, they passed by training rooms where experienced students honed their skills. The sounds of shuriken clashing and jutsu practice served as a constant reminder of the hard work and dedication required to become a skilled shinobi. The tour also included a visit to the library. Here, they were encouraged to make use of the resources to further their education and training. The classroom where they would spend much of their time was also part of the tour. Each student had their designated seat, and the chalkboard at the front of the room was already covered in notes and diagrams. Outside, they explored the academy's training grounds, where wooden targets, obstacle courses, and sparring areas awaited. This was where they would put their skills to the test, under the watchful eye of their instructors. The tour allowed the students to familiarize themselves with the academy's layout. After the tour, Ruji gave them a briefing on what lessons they would have for the upcoming academy calendar. Since they just joined the academy, their first year would be solely on theoretical knowledge and chakra control exercises. For the theoretical lessons, they studied math, history, physics, biology, chemistry, and geography. All this was in the context of shinobi ways. This was done, so that other kids could catch up to the clan kids. Besides theoretical lessons, they would also have fitness classes every day so that they do not fall behind. Their daily routine consisted of theoretical lessons from morning till noon, followed by a break. They would have their fitness classes in the afternoons, after which they would call it a day. Since I already know most of the theoretical knowledge, except history, I should find something productive to do during those lessons. Rinjiro racked his brain until an idea popped up in his head. Yes, I could do that. I need to start refining my chakra nature transformation with the basic elements. I only have fire locked down. His only options were water, wind, earth, and lightning. He weighed out the pros and cons of both elements. Earth should be the best choice, the rest are too eye-catching to practice under the radar. Also, it would not hurt to get a head start in learning its defensive jutsus. 
Inasmuch as fire and wind were his main affinities, Renjiro wanted to have a basic understanding of all elemental manipulation. As a shinobi, Renjiro expected to face other shinobi from the five main villages. To increase his odds, he had to have jutsus and elemental understanding so that he could counter them. It's not like he wanted to become like Hiruzen, the one known as the professor of the shinobi, as he had mastered all five chakra natures. Renjiro knew this would be had because since he only had an affinity towards fire and wind, he would have a hard time comprehending the other chakra natures as well as their jutsus. Also, a small part of Renjiro wanted to see whether he could master any chakra nature and develop a Kekiai Genkai like Magnet Release or a Kekiai Tota like Dust Release if he was lucky. Would he? Renjiro was not sure if he had caught a serious case of delusion or not. Making up his mind, Renjiro implemented his plan the following day in class. After school, he visited the clan library to read up on basic chakra nature transformation, especially for the earth chakra nature. Renjiro thought, it seems that there are two primary ways to become proficient in earth transformation. The first step is to crush a stone. Which made me think of the cutting leaves chakra exercise. For the second way, clay was shaped into various forms, hardened, and other things using just chakra. It makes sense. The majority of earth-style jutsus that I can recall essentially involved only shifting a portion of the earth surface. Clay molding will be quite beneficial. In terms of stone crushing, I could try smashing boulders to further my understanding of earth's nature, but in terms of clay molding, all I had to do was add more clay. With that, Renjiro returned the scroll to the shelf and left the library. He bought a small pack of clay for 5 Rio on his way home. Sara Uchiha sat at her desk in the Hidden Leaf Village Academy, glancing around the classroom as the other students engaged in conversations. Her dark, expressive eyes locked onto Renjiro as he approached, a faint smile on her lips. He finally came. Classes were about to begin and since Renjiro did not appear at their designated meeting point, her brother, Kaido, became impatient and they had to leave for the academy. Thankfully, Renjiro did not have to worry about his seat because, for some weird reason, everyone seemed to stick to the same sitting places they had on the first day of school. It was like some unspoken rule. Seeing Renjiro walk in and just sit without even saying a word, Sara decided to initiate the conversation. Glancing at Renjiro, she said, Hey Ren, are you alright? You were late this morning. Sara had made it a habit to shorten Renjiro's name and since Ren did not have an issue with it, it continued. About that, I just overslept a bit. Sorry for that. Renjiro answered. Well, tell that to Kaido, he was the one mad about it, Sara said. No worries, Kaido is always mad about something. Renjiro looked over towards Kaido, who was busy talking to another boy and retorted. This caused Sora to release a soft giggle. It seemed she was also aware of Kaido's attitude towards Renjiro, which was a bit unbecoming. Maybe it is just a phase. Wait do children in this world go through the rebellious phases? They have to mature early, after all. Renjiro's relationship towards Kaido was shaky as they rarely talked, yet the guy seemed to have an issue with him while his relationship towards Sora was more amicable. Just then, Ruji entered the classroom and the lectures for the day started. Since the first lesson was history, Renjiro paid attention to the class and learned some interesting facts. Ruji was teaching them about the formation of the Hidden Leaf Village. It was interesting to learn that the majority of the clans that joined Kanoha did so out of request from the Uchiha clan and not the Senju clan. This was shocking as one would have assumed, with Madara's vengeful nature and Hashirama's benevolent nature, it would be the other way around. I guess they were both black sheep in their clans in some way. But knowing Madara's power, I am sure they thought that they did not have any other option. Renjiro mused. After the history lesson, Renjiro decided to focus on his earth chakra nature training. He had begun his training on it the previous night out of sheer excitement. As Ruji was writing something on the board, Renjiro brought out the clay he had brought. He first observed every one of his classmates. Just like how the Uchiha trio was sitting together so did the other children from different clans. Since their batch had 30 students, they had 5 rows and 3 columns. There was a pair of students sitting on every column. The two Hyugas, Kenta and Hayori were diligently paying attention to what Ruji was teaching. The two Naras, Hayate and Sho, were dosing off at the back of the classroom. The Inazuka trio, Makoto, Mitsuki and Siba, were also busy messing around. The rest of the clan kids were either distracted or paying attention or somewhere in between. Renjiro began channeling his chakra into the clay. As he was doing this, his attention was on Ruji to see whether he noticed the chakra fluctuation. Either he isn't a sensory ninja and if he is, he must be really bad at it. Fortunately, both scenarios are fine with me. Renjiro mused when he realized Ruji did not sense anything strange. Renjiro took a deep breath, 
allowing the steady flow of chakra to build within him. His chakra, an invisible force, began to flow from his palm towards the clay. The sensation was subtle but tangible as if he were extending an invisible hand to manipulate the material. The clay responded to the touch of his chakra, softening and becoming more pliable. Renjiro's brow furrowed in concentration as he started to shape the clay with precise movements of his fingertips. He envisioned his chakra melding with the clay, allowing him to mold it into the form he desired. It was a slow and meticulous process, but one that he approached with dedication. The clay yielded to his chakra-infused touch, taking on new shapes and contours under his guidance. As he continued to work on the clay, Renjiro could feel the connection between himself and the earth strengthening. This feels like I am back in kindergarten playing with Play-Doh. Pleased with his rate of progress, Renjiro decided to repeat the cycle for the rest of the day. By the time they were breaking off for the fitness class, he had already gotten a good grasp of it. This came at the cost of mental fatigue as earth was not one of his elemental affinity. I should move to wind, but that isn't something I can do during lectures. I guess I should change my routine to fit in working on wind, water and lightning chakra transformation. I also need to start working on my ninjutsu. Inasmuch as Renjiro had managed to learn the great fireball jutsu, he only learned it from Miwa with the help of his Sharingan. He had just mimicked the hand signs and was able to perform the jutsu. The Sharingan sure can be a cheat code when used well. But I am sure my fire affinity played a large role together with practice since I had to try numerous times to finally succeed. Otherwise, I would be able to plagiarize every jutsu available. He had only brushed up on the different hand signs as the majority of his focus was on his physical training. Speaking about his training, Renjiro had started feeling like his workouts were beginning to lose their effectiveness. Should I get weights with seals? It might help. No, let me first finish up on the chakra nature transformation training then I can think about it. With that thought, Renjiro headed to the clan library. Lately, it had become a second home to him. Renjiro had already visited the public library but he realized the information there, apart from jutsus, was shallow as compared to the clan library. He could have asked Miwa about this but for the past weeks, she has been away, properly on a mission. Renjiro looked for scrolls containing information regarding hand signs. His main objective was to deepen his knowledge of it. Since he had been quite impulsive in pestering Miwa to teach him his first jutsu. But it was understandable, right? Hand signs were a fundamental aspect of performing ninja techniques. They were intricate, specific sequences of hand and finger movements that helped ninja mold and control their chakra to produce a desired jutsu. There were a total of 12 basic hand signs, which are represented by different animals of the zodiac. Each sign corresponded to a specific set of finger placements and movements. For example, the rat sign involved interlocking the fingers, while the snake sign requires the fingers to be intertwined and curved. Different hand signs are used to manipulate chakra in various ways, such as shaping it for a fireball jutsu or creating a protective barrier. Some jutsu require only a few hand signs, while more complex techniques demand a longer sequence. High-level techniques often require a greater level of chakra control and precise hand movements. Only mastery of jutsu would lead to the reduction of hand signs required for a jutsu. This was what Renjiro dreamt about. Some advanced shinobi are capable of performing hand signs with only one hand or even no hand signs at all. This demonstrated their exceptional chakra control and mastery. After digesting the knowledge, Renjiro was ready to restart his ninjutsu training. I need to start my ninjutsu training. Once I am done with the three academy jutsus, then I can move forward with getting weights with seals to improve my physical workouts. Or should I also start working on fuenjutsu? I am an uzumaki after all. Renjiro's fascination with fuenjutsu had been a constant source of curiosity since he arrived in the world of Naruto. He had always heard stories about the uzumaki clan's proficiency in this complex and versatile branch of ninja techniques. No, there will be more time for studying seals. Plus, it is way more time-consuming as compared to ninjutsu and taijutsu. I'll just buy the weights. I am probably around 5 years younger than Kushina, so it will be better to find a way to learn fuenjutsu from her since she was a prodigy instead of stumbling around on my own. Between the three academy jutsus, which should I first focus on? In terms of difficulty levels the substitution jutsu, also known as kawarimi no jutsu, should be easy. While it requires quick reflexes and situational awareness, the basic principle of substituting oneself with an object or another person is relatively straightforward. Its minimal chakra usage and the advantage of strategic repositioning are also a plus. However, the limited frequency of effective substitutions and the potential predictability as skilled opponents may anticipate its use of the technique and counter accordingly is a con. The next option is the clone jutsu also known as Bunshin no jutsu. 
While versatile, it is generally considered moderately challenging as it requires good chakra control and a thorough understanding of the technique. The good thing is I have larger chakra reserves than my peers, at least that's what I have sensed from my classmates. Apart from diversion during fights, this can help me increase the potency of my training, just like Naruto, but I'll need the multi-shadow clone jutsu. Not sure if Miwa can teach it to me. But teaching such a jutsu to an academy student is crazy. I will just have to bid my time on it. How I am going to get it is a problem for future me. The only other drawback apart from large chakra consumption is the fragility of the shadow clones created. Maybe I can come up with a way to create solid clones. That would be more legendary than the Hiration. The last one is the Transformation Jutsu, otherwise known as Henge no Jutsu, which is often considered the most challenging among the three. It requires not only precise hand signs and chakra control but also a keen understanding of the form or person being mimicked. Maintaining the transformation convincingly can be mentally taxing, and the risk of scrutiny by observant individuals adds an extra layer of complexity. The jutsu can also be used to deceive enemies by appearing as an ally or concealing one's identity evidenced by what Naruto did in the Chunin exam's preliminary battle against Kiba. Sustaining the transformation would not be much of a hurdle but if I meet someone with keen observation skills or even dojitsus like the Byakugan, it will be hard to fool them. I have already prioritized them in terms of my perceived difficulty. I will have to begin with the substitution jutsu. With that, Renjiro decided to ask for the necessary scroll from the library and headed to his yard to begin his training. In a quiet corner of his training area, Renjiro had a scroll laid out before him. With a deep breath, he turned his attention to the scroll containing instructions for Kawarimi no Jutsu. The instructions were precise, a step-by-step -step guide to mastering the essence of the Jutsu. The learning process was simplified into three steps. They were the hand signs, visualization and finally timing and precision. He focused on the crucial section that detailed the hand signs required for the jutsu. The required hand signs were tiger horse, dog, rat, bird. The sequence was critical, each sign flowing seamlessly into the next. Renjiro studied the illustrations, recognizing the intricate movements required. The challenge lay in both speed and precision, as the substitution technique demanded rapid execution in the heat of battle. Damn, it has five hand signs. I never saw anyone in the anime performing the hand signs. With unwavering determination, Renjiro mimicked the hand signs, repeating them again and again until the fluidity of his movements improved. The next step emphasized visualization, which was the most important one of all. Renjiro closed his eyes and envisioned the environment around him, the rustling leaves, the breeze against his skin, and the sounds of his training area. This mental preparation was crucial. The substitution technique required more than mere physical agility, it required a deep connection with the surroundings. He imagined an attacker and envisioned the precise moment when evasion was necessary. This mental rehearsal was a vital component of the jutsu. The next and final step was timing and precision. Renjiro knew that the success of the substitution technique hinged on this last step. He practiced the hand signs with increased fervor, refining his movements to an acceptable degree. As he repeated the signs, the chakra within him surged, like a coiled spring ready to release. For his first attempt, Renjiro decided to switch places with a dry twig that was a couple of meters in front of him. Puff! Renjiro seemingly exploded in a ball of smoke Renjiro actually succeeded in his first attempt. It all happened in a blink of an eye. He was standing where the dry twig was minutes ago. It was a bit disorienting but nothing too serious. I thought I would have to try it more than once to succeed like the chakra control exercises, I guess I am a little bit talented, Renjiro pondered. Still, the time I am using with the hand signs is too much. I need to reduce the time to at least two or three hand signs before the end of the day. Minutes turned into hours as Renjiro dedicated himself to mastering the substitution jutsu. With each attempt, he felt himself drawing closer to the moment of a seamless transition. He knew that the true test would come in the field when a split-second decision could mean the difference between survival and failure. As the sun dipped below the horizon, Renjiro set the scroll aside, a glimmer of confidence in his eyes. He was not yet a master of the technique, but he had taken the first crucial steps on his journey. He had managed to get a hang of the jutsu in the four hours that he practiced. He had also managed to reduce the hand signs required to only four hand signs. He had built up some resistance to the nausea brought about by performing the jutsu. Unfortunately, resistance was not immunity. One thing he was sure of was, that he would be over the nausea by the time he managed to perform the jutsu with one or two hand signs. Welp, better call this a day. It took longer than I thought and actually ate into my chakra nature transformation training time. I better keep practicing it to raise it to an acceptable level. 
For the rest of the year, Renjiro continued with his routine. He used to wake up at the crack of dawn, which was around 5 in the morning. He would proceed to work out for 2 hours until 7, where he would prepare himself for classes beginning at 8. After school, from 3 in the afternoon, Renjiro would head back home to work on his chakra nature transformation until dusk. He started with wind, which wrecked most of his yard due to its chaotic nature, before moving on to lightning, water and finally fire. Weirdly enough he spent most of his time on wind nature because slicing the leaves became easy and he had to do so to countless ones simultaneously to make the exercise challenging. After that, he would take a break, where he took his supper and waited to recover his chakra reserves, then proceed to work on his ninjutsu. Just like with the substitution jutsu, Renjiro had similar success in learning the transformation and clone jutsus in a fairly quick manner. Renjiro really wished that he could get the shadow clone jutsu since it could make his training easier. The more clones he could make, the more experience he could get but sadly he had to work with what he had at hand. Renjiro was a man, or in this case a boy, on a mission. He wanted to reduce the hand signs required for the three jutsus to one or two just like he did for the great fireball jutsu, which currently required one hand sign. He achieved this for the most part as he had mastered the three E-rank jutsus to the level where he only required two hand signs to perform them. For the clone jutsu, he had managed to increase the number of clones he could make to four. With the passage of time, the end of year exams was slowly creeping in on Renjiro. Renjiro finally wondered whether to start preparing for exams as he was still engrossed in his training. Still 20 days for written exams. It's way too early, he thought. Two weeks into the exam, Renjiro finally decided to start preparing for the exam. Finally, the day of Renjiro's end-of-year exams at the academy arrived, and the anticipation in the air was palpable. The village hidden in the leaves had prepared its young ninjas in training with months of rigorous education, both in the practical and majorly theoretical aspects of being a shinobi. As Renjiro made his way to the exam hall, he couldn't help but reflect on the journey he had embarked upon since joining the academy. The sprawling academy building stood tall before him, a symbol of his growth and progress. The corridors echoed with the soft murmur of students exchanging last-minute insights and offering one another words of encouragement. Upon entering the exam hall, Renjiro was met with the familiar sight of a large, dimly lit room. Rows of wooden desks and chairs were neatly aligned in precise order, awaiting the eager young minds about to be tested. The desks were devoid of any materials, emphasizing that this exam was a true test of their knowledge, without the aid of scrolls, weapons, or tools. The atmosphere inside the hall was heavy, with a mixture of determination and anxiety. Renjiro took his assigned seat, feeling the cool, polished wood beneath his fingertips. He organized his writing tools, including a sharpened pencil and a pristine sheet of parchment, ready to face the questions that awaited. The exam papers, neatly stacked, were distributed with precision. The questions had been carefully crafted to test their understanding of the fundamental subjects that were essential to their development as shinobi. Renjiro calmly scanned the first page, his eyes taking in the range of topics from chakra control to the history of the village, combat strategies, and the principles of teamwork. With a deep breath, he delved into the questions. Each query was a challenge to demonstrate not only what they had learned but how they could apply that knowledge in practical situations. The room was silent, save for the soft rustling of papers and the occasional scratching of pencils on parchment. The minutes ticked away, but Renjiro pressed on, drawing from the wisdom imparted throughout the year. As he completed his last response and handed in his paper, Renjiro could not help but smirk. My clutch come through as always. I guess copying theoretical knowledge was way easier than jutsus. Some may say that I was wasting the Sharingan by using it on the exam, but I call that effective training. The results would soon be revealed, so Renjiro patiently waited for the next part of the exams. In the afternoon, they moved on to the fitness test. The fitness test was basically what they went through during their entrance assessment but with more intensity. This was because since all of them had unlocked their chakras and had daily fitness classes, they were expected to have better endurance. For the fitness test, the training grounds became a hive of activity, with the young shinobi preparing to showcase their physical prowess, agility, and endurance. Renjiro, like his peers, had diligently trained in the physical aspects of being a shinobi, and this was the moment to put his skills to the test. Thankfully, he was in tip-top shape. The training grounds were expansive, with various stations set up to assess different aspects of their physical abilities. There was a sprinting track, an obstacle course, a target range for shuriken throwing, and an area designated for sparring to demonstrate taijutsu skills. Each station represented a critical skill that a ninja needed to excel in. 
Although they had not started weapon throwing classes and taijutsu spars, the students were allowed to demonstrate their skills for extra credit. But mainly, this was a playground for the students from shinobi clans or those who took personal initiative to read ahead of the teacher. The sprinting track was lined with markers, and a group of instructors stood at the starting line, ready to time the students. The skill being tested was speed, which was crucial for both evasion and pursuing enemies. Renjiro began working on his cardio even before he joined the academy, so it was a walkthrough for him. See what I did? Moving on to the obstacle course, Renjiro encountered a series of challenges, including walls to climb, hurdles to leap over, and tunnels to crawl through. This section of the test evaluated agility and adaptability, qualities that were vital for navigating difficult terrains and escaping dangerous situations. At the target range, Renjiro took aim with his kunais, focusing on precision and accuracy. With his Sherigon, this part of the test was made for him as they all struck their marks. Renjiro and Siba Inazuka faced off in the sparring area, their challenge confined to pure taijutsu, without the aid of Siba's loyal Nin Ken. As they circled each other, the intensity of the match was palpable. With a display of swift strikes and expert evasion, Renjiro managed to outmaneuver Siba. Since he had somewhat gotten used to sparring with Miwa, given that she was largely holding back, the fight was not close at all. It was like taking candy from a child. The fitness test capped everything off. There was nothing much to say about it as Renjiro aced it just like the previous stations. The students of the academy breathed a collective sigh of relief as the final exams came to a close. The examination papers and fitness tests had been rigorous tests of their knowledge and abilities, and now, it was a waiting game. The teachers had already collected all the results and retreated to evaluate the results. As the students dispersed, a sense of anticipation hung in the air. Many of them gathered in small groups, discussing the challenges they had faced and the questions that had stumped them. It was a moment of camaraderie, a shared experience that would bond them together as they progressed on their shinobi journey. Rinjiro found a quiet spot beneath the shade of a towering tree. He sat down, his back against the rough bark, and gazed out at the tranquil surroundings of the academy courtyard. Some students used this brief respite to practice their jutsu or spar with their peers, eager to keep their skills sharp even in the midst of uncertainty. Others simply enjoyed the tranquility, finding solace in the peaceful moments before the results were revealed. The teachers diligently reviewed the papers, calculating the scores and assessing the performance of each student. It was a task that required careful consideration, as the results would shape the path of these young ninjas. After a period of tense waiting, the teachers returned to the courtyard, bearing the results of the exams. The students fell into a hushed silence, their eyes fixed on the instructors who held their destinies in their hands. With a calm but authoritative tone, one of the teachers began to read out the results one by one. Some faces lit up with smiles of triumph, while others bore expressions of disappointment. As expected, Renjiro took the top spot. The results for the top 5 were, 1, Uzumaki Renjiro, 100 plus 23 plus 23 plus 49 plus 49 is equal to 244 2. Hyuga Kenta, 100 plus 19 plus 20 plus 43 plus 44 is equal to 226 3. Hyuga Hayori, 91 plus 19 plus 23 plus 39 plus 43 is equal to 215 4. Nara Heiei, 100 plus 11 plus 19 plus 30 plus 30 is equal to 195. Achiha Sora, 79 plus 15 plus 16 plus 32 plus 32 is equal to 174 as the results were announced for each student, the courtyard filled with a mix of emotions, from cheers of joy to moments of reflection. The results were for the written test, sprinting, obstacle race, weapon throwing and taijutsu in respective order. The written test was out of 100 points, sprinting and obstacle race were both out of 25 points while taijutsu and weapon throwing were out of 50 points. The most number of points one could get cumulatively was 250 points. Hyuga Kenta is a true genius if he could score all those points at his age. I can't believe the gap between him and me, an adult in a child's body, is quite close. Although I came first as expected, I can't let this get to my head. For all I know this doesn't prove anything. But it is good to see Sora doing well. As Renjiro was thinking about the results so was a certain Hyuga. Kenta had expected to do well in the exams. But his results only ended up frustrating him. Although his performance in the written test is a bit surprising, considering he rarely pays attention to the instructors, I was not expecting him to be better than me at Taijutsu. Father was right. Just because I was better than my peers at the clan doesn't mean that I was strong. I need to improve. While Rinjiro was still deep in thoughts over the exam results, a wave of prickling sensation washed over him. He instinctively turned his head around when he noticed Kenta and Hayori Hyuga, 
two of his fellow students, staring intently at him. It didn't take long for Renjiro to deduce the reason behind their frustration. It was likely related to the exam results. With a knowing glance, he chose to ignore their discontent, understanding that involving himself in petty squabbles would do more harm than good. Renjiro's results did cause a stir in both the student and teacher communities. One of the teachers affected was Ruji, his homeroom teacher. He was not answering my questions in class and still managed to get everything? Why was he playing dumb? There was also that incident where I found soil on his desk. What was he busy doing? With the official announcement of the exam results, the two-month vacation period for the academy students began. Renjiro felt a sense of relief and excitement, knowing that he would have some time to rest and recuperate before the next phase of his training. Fortunately, Miwa, his fellow Achiha and aunt, had also returned to the village. Renjiro was happy because she would be of great help in his training for the next month. As Renjiro basked in the mixed atmosphere of relief and excitement following the announcement of the exam results, he noticed Sora Achiha approaching him with a warm smile on her face. Her onyx eyes sparkled with genuine joy. Renjiro, congratulations on your performance in the exams, Sara said, her voice filled with sincerity. You did really well, and I'm genuinely happy for you. Renjiro appreciated her kind words and smiled back. Thank you, Sara. However, as he turned his attention to Kaido, the atmosphere grew noticeably colder. Kaido, with an insincere smile that barely reached his eyes, muttered a half-hearted, Congratulations, Renjiro. Renjiro could sense the lack of genuine warmth in Kaido's words. It wasn't a surprise, as their interactions had often been marked by tension and rivalry, at least on Kaido's side. Kaido's insincere congratulations hung in the air for a moment before he simply turned and walked away without waiting for a response. Renjiro exchanged a knowing glance with Sora, understanding that not all well wishes were as heartfelt as they seemed. Despite the mixed reactions, he remained focused on his journey ahead. Renjiro had a plan for the two-month break. He wanted to ensure that Renjiro had a plan for the two-month break. He wanted to ensure that before his second year of the academy started, he should be able to reduce the hand signs required for all his jutsus to only one hand sign. This endeavor took him around two weeks to accomplish even with continuous training. With no classes, he was able to train from dusk to dawn. After accomplishing his goal, he planned to talk to Miwa about certain prospects he was interested in exploring. Currently, he was in Miwa's house. Ah Renjiro. It's been long since I last saw you. How is the academy taking you? He wasn't this tall the last time I saw him. Miwa mused as he studied the young boy whose physical appearance had changed since she last saw him. It's been okay. I have just finished my first year and we are now on a two-month break. Of course, it was okay for you I heard that you were at the top of your class. Good work Renjiro, keep it up. Thank you, Miwa-sama. It was all thanks to your help that I was able to perform well in my exams. You don't need to be humble Renjiro. Besides I have not been in the village for quite some time, so my help shouldn't have contributed much. It's okay Miwa-sama, I actually came here because I need help with something, what do you need help with? Miwa asked. Right before we closed for our break, our instructor mentioned some avenues that we could explore as shinobi and becoming a sensory nin caught my eye so you could help me with this? Miwa sat in silence as thoughts ran in her head. Hmm, becoming a sensory ninja. Is he even fit for that? I have always thought that he would be suitable as an assault ninja because of his high chakra reserves. Not to forget, Renjiro has had issues with his chakra control so becoming a sensory nin, if possible, will be a tall order. No, it would be counterproductive for me to discourage him at the start. I will just have to help him find his way and let him learn from his own mistakes. But who should I ask to help him? Should I ask Sensei? He might be busy with the current skirmishes at the border. Well, it won't hurt to try. Miwa, concluding what she needed to do, asked, Are you sure about this? Renjiro quickly nodded. He wanted to be an all-round type of ninja, plus becoming a sensory ninja was an integral part of his plan. A master of none was better than a master of one. In battle, sensory ninjas could discern hidden targets, and locate key opponents, giving their team, or even them as individuals, a strategic advantage. Okay then, meet me here tomorrow morning. We will go and see someone who can help you with this as I do not have much experience in this. Thank you Miwa-sama. Rinjiro, right as he was leaving, Miwa held him back. Take a break. It's fine to train, but you have to have enough rest for your body to grow. I will do so Miwa-sama. I guess she really cares about me. This feels nice. Renjiro thought as he left and decided to have an off day today. After all, he had been training continuously for days. He decided to visit the town as his life in the clan compound had become monotonous lately. 
In the evening, he had his usual training routine after which he retired to bed and waited for the next day. The early morning sun painted the village with a warm, golden hue as Renjiro made his way to Miwa's residence after completing his customary workout. He arrived at her doorstep at the precise time they had agreed upon. A brisk knock led to the door swinging open to reveal Miwa. Good morning, Renjiro, Miwa said, are you ready for today? Renjiro nodded with a glint of excitement in his eyes, absolutely, Miwa-sama. With that, the two Uchiha set out together, navigating the familiar streets of Kanoha. They made their way to the heart of the village, where the sensory core was stationed. As they approached the impressive building, the distinctive emblem of the sensory division came into view, signifying its role as the sentinel of the village's safety. The sensory core headquarters was a structure of both functionality and elegance. Tall, imposing, and surrounded by carefully maintained gardens, it exuded an air of seriousness and dedication. Miwa confidently led the way through the corridors until they reached a door where they stopped. With a brief knock, they were granted entry. Inside the office, they were met by a middle-aged man who seemed to be in his forties. His appearance exuded a sense of wisdom and authority that was likely earned through years of experience. His salt and pepper hair was neatly combed, and he wore the traditional attire of a Jonin Kanoha shinobi with a black overall above his green flak jacket. He also had the Yamanaka crest on his shoulders. His eyes, a striking shade of pale lavender, held a depth of knowledge that spoke of his mastery as a shinobi. Should have known he was from the Yamanaka clan. Renjiro thought. Miwa, welcome and this must be Renjiro, the man greeted them, his voice resonating with a calm and assured tone. He motioned for them to take a seat. The man's gaze settled on Renjiro, and there was a subtle flicker of recognition in his eyes. So this is Renjiro, Eri spoke highly of him. Sato thought. Renjiro, this is Yamanake Sato. He was my genin sensei. He might be old and grumpy now but do not let that fool you, he is one of the best sensory ninja in Kanoha? Sato's eyes twitched at Miwa's introduction. He was barely 40, how was that old? He was in his prime. Damn you Miwa, I see you still have that sharp mouth of yours Miwa. This must be Uzumaki Renjiro, the new talent from the Uchiha clan. Sato said while turning to face Renjiro. Yeah, he is grumpy all right. Renjiro thought before saying, thank you, sir. Renjiro accepted the compliment. I hear you want to become a sensory ninja, let's first see if you have enough talent. If you don't then there is no point in wasting time. Sato said as his face quickly turned serious. He first lectured Renjiro on what sensors do. Then, he instructed Renjiro to sit in a meditative pose and taught him how to sense his chakra field. It took nearly half an hour for Renjiro to sense his chakra field. The instructions were very informative. Sato then tested Renjiro's chakra field a bit. After some testing, he concluded that Renjiro's chakra field had a radius of 10.8 meters. So much chakra for his age and large chakra field. He has a bright future. Sato commented, 10.8 meters, not bad. An average ninja has a chakra field of 4 to 5 meters. In the Yamanaka clan, we train our youngsters to become sensors if their chakra field exceeds 7 meters, while for other Kanoha shinobi, the minimum requirement is 5.9 meters. However, that is just the bare minimum. Quite a few in the Yamanaka clan had their chakra field exceed 10 meters before they started training to become sensors. I had 11.6 meters. So while you can become a sensor, you'll have to work hard. Renjiro quickly nodded. Sato said, all right, I'll guide you. However, the process of training to become a sensor is quite complicated. We will need proper training facilities. I'll show you around and you will start visiting there daily at 10.30 am from tomorrow onwards. He then accompanied Sato to the training facility. The location was underground in the facility they were in. The facility was mostly empty with very few people being there. Sato said, these rooms isolate everything outside it. It also has seals that can eliminate all sound and smell in the room. So you'll have to entirely depend on your ability to sense. That makes sense, I see. I guess most of Kanoha's sensors are trained here. I assume that other students are using other rooms. Renjiro followed Sato inside a room. Now, this is where the real training begins. Now that we have already established your chakra field and its limit, we will move to the various ways we develop sensor Nin in the village. Sato began. I won't delve deeper into the details, but I will give you a list of exercises that will help you become a decent sensory if you put in the work. We will only do two for now, but if you show promise maybe we can move to the more advanced techniques. Any questions before we begin? Renjiro shook his head as he understood the gist of things so far, great. The first exercise will test your perception. Sato said while he took some balls from a cabinet in the corner and placed them at targets with varying distances in the room. 
I want you to focus on the targets in front of you, activate your chakra field and tell me what you sense. Hmm, I think I feel something. It's like a gentle pulsation, rhythmic and steady. Renjiro answered. Good, that's the chakra flow within the target. Now, observe closely as I infuse it with more chakra. Notice any changes in intensity or pattern. It's brighter and more vibrant than before. Excellent observation. This exercise will help you notice even the most subtle chakra fluctuations, which will be essential for tasks such as identifying hidden threats, tracking targets, and analyzing chakra-based techniques during combat or espionage missions. Now let's move to the second exercise, Sato said as replaced the balls in the targets. If Renjiro had not activated his chakra field, he would not have been able to tell the difference between the two sets of balls. The newer set of balls had far little chakra, even before Sato's chakra infusion. This exercise is a chakra source localization one. We are going to rob you of your sight and smell senses by blindfolding you and placing a seal on you. You have to rely on your chakra field to pinpoint the targets. We'll first start with stationary targets. Renjiro was handed a blindfold and the seals in the room were activated. Out of the three senses that Renjiro was left with, only hearing would be useful in the test, but that was untouched since Sato had to instruct him during the exercise. Are you ready? Yes, Renjiro said. He was a bit uncomfortable as the situation was like sleeping with a cold but without the nasal congestion. Alright, activate your chakra field and try sensing the targets. Even with my sight and smell, it would still be hard to sense the chakra in the targets. Renjiro lamented while he activated his chakra field. The only chakra I can sense is mine and Sato's. The little chakra in the new set of targets made them hard to sense. Now, tell me the direction of the targets. I can sense one of the targets here, here and here. Renjiro pointed to his left, behind and above him. Three? He got three of them? It took me a whole week to even sense one despite having a larger chakra field at the same age. Ho ho three out of five on your first try? That's good work Renjiro. It seems that this is a bit too easy for you. Let's switch things up. Sato said as he flared his chakra up. Damn. Is that all his chakra? I want to be like that when I grow up. If that's the case, what about Naruto and other Jinchurikis? Besides being suffocated by Sato's chakra, Renjiro was amazed by the display. Now try sensing the targets again. Renjiro's brows furrowed as he tried to focus on the targets, but he couldn't. It was hard trying to sense objects with little chakra while someone was flaring his chakra right beside him. All his chakra field could pick up was Sato. It isn't as easy as before huh, Sato said as he saw the near bloated look on Renjiro's face. He then reined in his chakra and removed the blindfold on Renjiro. You need to be able to perceive and differentiate the type of chakra that you want to sense. It might be hard now but I am sure with your potential you will soon get a hang of it. I won't always be free but you are free to come and use this room. If you have any questions, you can just ask any of the attendants available, I am sure they will help. That's it for today. Thank you for your guidance Sato Sensei. I look forward to your growth Renjiro. Don't disappoint me. With those words, they went back to his where Miwa was waiting and after a bit of banter, they headed back home. Good work. Sato said with a tinge of elation evident in his voice. A week, while it's not bad, it is not good either. But I am sure he will still be an exceptional sensor. Kanoha severely lacks sensors as only three clans have specialized in this. Having another sensor out of these clans would be good enough. Meanwhile, Renjiro could only sigh in relief. He placed his hands on his glabella massaging it. He hoped that it would lessen the mental fatigue that comes with activating his chakra field for a long time. Renjiro had continued with his sensor training and if he could sum it up in one word it would be frustration. It even made self-doubt creep in and Renjiro started wondering whether he was cut out for this or not. It was only the boon from being a sensory ninja that pushed him through this. Sato, on the other hand, was also relieved. It had taken Renjiro a whole week to sense the targets with his chakra field. It was so close to the deadline Sato had set for him as after that Sato had to return to his duties. Now we are going to keep altering the distances we place the objects, but since you've already sensed them, try zoning in on their chakra signatures and it will be fairly easy, Sato remarked. Following Sato's instructions, it became relatively easier for Renjiro to sense the targets even when they were moving. He went from barely sensing them at all to now sensing them 7 out of 10 times by the end of their session. The upside is that my chakra field is like a muscle. The more I use it, the more it grows just like my chakra reserves. This can be attributed to the growth phase I am in. Hopefully, the decline rate is in the far, far future. Renjiro thought. His chakra field had grown and was now 12 and a half meters wide, around 41 feet. 
After his session with Sato, Renjiro headed back to the clan as they had arranged a training exercise. It was more of a workshop where all the clan children, Genin and academy students got together and competed. The Uchiha clan compound was buzzing with activity as the clan children gathered for a special training workshop. The courtyard, surrounded by traditional Uchiha buildings, echoed with the enthusiastic chatter of young ninjas eager to hone their skills. Rinjiro, dressed in a distinctive all-black attire, made his way through the crowd. The workshop, organized by the clan leaders, aimed to foster a sense of unity among the Uchiha young ones while providing them with a platform to share and refine their abilities. The main focus of course would be refining their Taijutsu and Sharingan, for those who awakened it of course. It was through this that Renjiro got to meet his upperclassmen in the clan. He was shocked to learn of their identities as he remembered them from the anime. They were Inabi, Yashiro and Tekka. At least now I know how I will be when the anime events finally start. Renjiro mused. Renjiro joined the sparring area, where Uchiha children engaged in friendly but intense bouts of Taijutsu. It did not take long before Renjiro found Kaido spectating a bout between some genins. Noticing Renjiro, Kaido made his way towards him. Renjiro raised his brow when he saw this as they were not well acquainted. Renjiro, let's spar, Kaido said with a dramatic flair that only seemed to exist in his head. So that's what he wanted. Fine, Renjiro responded. His sensory training had been a bit frustrating and he needed to find a way to vent about it. Maybe this spar would be a great opportunity to do so. Without further ado, they quickly made their way to an empty sparring area and started preparing themselves for the spar. Kaido had yet to awaken his Sharingan, so to keep the fight fair and interesting, he decided not to use his dojitsu. He needed to know what level other normal kids in this world were at. The sparring area, marked by a circle drawn in the dirt, became the arena for their friendly yet intense exchange of blows. Some Uchiha children gathered around, their eyes fixed on the impending clash between the two boys. Kaido stood at exactly 4 feet, 121 meters, which was just 3 inches shy away from Renjiro's height, 130 meters. This was considered tall for someone their age. His onyx hair and obsidian eyes framed his oblong face. With his lithe and agile figure, Kaido's well-built body was overemphasized. Hopes he makes this worthwhile. Renjiro thought. Kaido's opening move was a blur of swift kicks and punches. Renjiro, with his innate fast reflexes, dodged Kaido's initial onslaught, showcasing a keen ability to read his opponent's movements. He is fast, Renjiro thought. Kaido, however, countered with a series of quick jabs, testing Renjiro's defensive capabilities. But not fast enough. Renjiro absorbed Kaido's attacks, his movements fluid and calculated. Kaido weaved through Renjiro's defenses, aiming to exploit any opening. Renjiro showcased a blend of taijutsu and reflexes inherited from both the clan's technique, interceptor fist, and from his unique battle style, which he had been developing to counter the clan technique from his spars with Miwa. Kaido, on the other hand, relied on precision and swift maneuvers. Kaido favors speed and agility, but he often commits to his attacks. If I can anticipate his next move, I can turn the tide in my favor. Renjiro, with a sudden burst of energy, executed a sweeping kick, aiming to catch Kaido off guard. Kaido, however, anticipated the move and countered with a graceful spin, narrowly evading the attack. Renjiro's defense is solid. I need to find openings and capitalize on them. Kaido's movements became more unpredictable, a whirlwind of strikes designed to keep Renjiro on the defensive. A flurry of high-speed kicks and evasive maneuvers marked the climax of their spar. Renjiro, drawing upon his reflexes instilled in him, avoided a spinning kick from Kaido. Sensing an opening, Renjiro executed a precise counter, a sweeping leg movement that unbalanced Kaido momentarily. As Kaido stumbled, Renjiro seized the opportunity, launching into a rapid combination of strikes. Kaido caught off guard, struggled to regain his footing. Renjiro wins. The Chunin who was overseeing the spar shouted before continuing, make the seal of confrontation. I hope he got what he wanted, I always admire a trier. With that said, I have been neglecting my taijutsu. Maybe it's the lack of proper opponents. The only person I can go at without pulling punches is Miwa, but her missions always keep her out of the village. Man, I just hope that guy was old enough now so that I can learn a thing or two from him. Maybe I should start looking for his father. I am sure things will change for the better once I graduate from the academy. After forming the seal of confrontation, Renjiro did not see the need to stick around and immediately headed home. What were you even thinking challenging him? He's already at the top of the class in the academy. What does that make him better than me? He did not even use his Sharingan while fighting you and still won. Before Renjiro exited the ground, he caught a glimpse of a sibling squabble between Kaido and Sora. 
If one were to see the situation, they would think it was an older sister scolding a younger brother. Rinjiro just smirked at the interaction before he headed home. Although he was on cordial terms with Sora, it was none of his business after all. They were allowed to leave at their own pleasure as long as they partook in any activity. Since Renjiro was living off the clan, doing the bare minimum was okay. After he reached his abode, Renjiro decided to review his fight with Kaido. Although he massively handicapped himself, it was very informative. Although I am far much better than the rest, I am still far from my best. I need to find a way to balance my ninjutsu and taijutsu. There is no need to lean towards one side as there are monsters in this world who require insane amounts of power to even think of going against them. Since I will be focusing on my sensory practice for the next one and a half months, there shouldn't be a huge change in my schedule. But when I start my next year at the academy, I have to substitute my daily workouts with taijutsu in the meantime. I also need to plan for when I should start studying fuinjutsu. I want it to be a main component in combat. Rinjiro concluded by simplifying his schedule in the following order. After waking up, he would start with his physical workout, followed by his taijutsu practice. After a break, he would work on his sensory practice for the majority of the day. He would then work on his ninjutsu in the evenings, meditate then call it a day. He would continue with his basic routine until the end of his two-month break before starting his second year at the academy. As the second year at the Kanoha Ninja Academy commenced, a palpable shift occurred in the curriculum. The rigorous theoretical classes of the first year made way for a more hands-on approach, more practical, emphasizing practical applications of ninja skills. The history in the second year went far much deeper than the one they covered during their first year. The previous year's history focused on the flashy parts of Kanoha's history like the village formation and duel between Hashirama slash Madara and the like, stuff that made great stories rather than dry telling. They would now start covering the skirmishes and the relationship between the five major shinobi villages. They would also cover the first shinobi war which was a major turning point for the shinobi world. For the more recent history, like the Second Shinobi War and the fall of Kanoha's ally Yuzushiogakure, that would be left for more advanced years at the academy. The other theoretical class apart from history would be strategic thinking and planning. Here the students would learn how to analyze battlefield situations, anticipate enemy movements, and formulate effective strategies to achieve their objectives. Emphasis was placed on critical thinking, decision-making under pressure, and the importance of adaptability in combat scenarios. Of course, they would start with simpler scenarios and then gradually increase the intensity during their third year. With those two as the only theoretical classes, that left room for four practical areas of focus. They were combat maneuvers and techniques, weapon throwing, taijutsu slash hand-to-hand -hand combat and chakra control. For combat maneuvers and techniques, the students learn about various tactical formations, ambush tactics, and specialized techniques for different combat scenarios. The curriculum includes hands-on training sessions to familiarize students with executing tactical maneuvers effectively in simulated battles. More so when it comes to working in three, four, or five-man cell teams. The latter three would build upon what they covered the previous year. For weapon throwing, they would be training with the kunai, shuriken and senban as opposed to only one weapon as they did the previous year. For taijutsu they learn the basics of punching, kicking, grappling, and blocking, akin to the fundamentals of white belt karate or judo. Emphasis was placed on developing physical strength, agility, and coordination essential for hand-to-hand -hand combat scenarios. All this was so that they could not mess with their clan's taijutsu while also giving proper foundation to civilian ninjas. Lastly, chakra control would start exercises focusing on regulating chakra flow, enhancing control and precision in chakra manipulation. Verbal discussions introduce students to the various applications of chakra in ninjutsu, jinjutsu, and taijutsu. After Ruji gave them an overview of the second year during their first day in class, Renjiro started looking forward to the second year. There were some skills that he would learn which could propel him to great heights when mixed with his strength. Imagine your team has been tasked with safeguarding a caravan of merchants traveling through the land of hills. Your mission is to safely escort the convoy to its destination while minimizing casualties and mitigating enemy threats. But along the way, you encounter a group of rogue ninjas who want to target the caravan. What is the appropriate thing to do? Ruji asked his students on one fine morning. They were currently having one of their theoretical classes, strategic thinking and planning or as Renjiro had shortened it, strategy 101. Ruji sensei, shouldn't we just fight them so that we minimize any even of the rogue ninjas getting to the merchants? Akimichi Jima, a new addition to the class, asked. With the start of the new year, there were some missing faces as well as new faces in the elite batch of the second year. 
Since the elite batch consisted of academy students showing promise, it was understandable that the academy had taken a merit-based approach. Those who were at the bottom of the class during the end of the first year's exams were relegated to the lower batches, while those who were topping the lower batches were promoted. This was to foster healthy competition between the young children and force them not to foster complacency at any given time. You can't just rush at them and leave the caravan unprotected, Jima, that's an opening you are giving the enemy. What if some of them were hiding, waiting for that opportunity? Nara Hayate, who was sitting next to Jima, refuted his response. What's the fun in that? My big brother always says that the best defense is going on the offense. Inazuka Makoto, one of the Inazuka triplet in class, added. Your mission is safeguarding the caravan. Your priority should be to ensure that the merchants in the caravan are safe. After doing that, then maybe you can engage with the rogue ninjas. Ruji Sensei declared, intending to put the mini debate to an end. They are basically raising child soldiers. Renjiro, who was paying attention to class, surmised. It had been close to three years since Renjiro came to this world, but occasionally, he would still find normal things in the shinobi were strange to him. It was not strange for him to learn the strategies employed in the ninja world since he was an adult trapped in a child's body, but thinking about prepubescent kids doing the same was weird. Wasn't there some right against this? What do I always say? Ruji sensei asked. Listen to your jounin sensei and protect what or who you are supposed to protect first before doing anything else if it is a safeguarding mission. The student said in unison. Why do we do that? Because our jounin sensei are experienced and know best and perfectly accomplishing the mission means that the village gets more mission. The students replied in unison. This is the real will of fire. Rinjiro chuckled at the thought as class ended. Remember to complete the assignment that I had given yesterday. I will check it at the end of the week. Ruji sensei said as the kids were leaving the class. His voice was drowned in the sea of chatter as the students were happy to be finally heading for lunch. They only had one class left before calling it a day. Since the class was weapon throwing, then it made sense to have it in the afternoon. Swish. Thud. Thunk. With a swift motion, Renjiro drew another kunai, the metallic gleam catching the sunlight as he aimed. With a flick of his wrist, he sent the kunai hurtling through the air, the sound of its trajectory slicing through the silence like a sharp whistle. Swish. Thud. Swish. Thunk. The kunai struck its target dead center, embedding itself with a satisfying thud as Renjiro's keen eyes assessed his next mark. He repeated the process with each throw executed with precision and finesse. Thud. Swish. Thunk. Good work Renjiro, their instructor of the day, Hirano Tatsuo began, next. Whoa. Have you seen that? Renjiro has hit all the targets. Yeah, he never misses. And he looks good while doing so. Sometimes when his eyes are red and it matches his hair, he looks more handsome. You dumbass, that's the Sharingan. Huh? Sharingan? He isn't an Uchiha? Who's the dumbass now? Ever since Renjiro excelled in his first end of year exams, he had gained some fans. Most of them were girls, thankfully. But Renjiro was no pedo so he did not pay much attention to it. My aim is perfect when it comes to the kunai, even without using the Sharingan. But when it comes to the Senban or Shuriken, I need the Sharingan to have an accurate aim. Looks like I have my work cut out for me. And you sight. After class ended, Sara immediately approached Renjiro, um. Renjiro how are you doing? I am fine Sora. Do you have any plans now? Ah. I got some good wind release jutsus that I wanted to start working on. Renjiro contemplated for a while before saying, I was about to go home and work ninjutsu. Why are you asking? Ninjutsu? He probably means the major academy ninjutsu that Ruji sensei talked about the other day. I already know the substitution jutsu. So it is good that he hasn't left me that much behind. Sara thought. I was hoping that you could help us with practicing weapon throwing. Renjiro noticed that Kaido was a few meters ahead eyeing them. You or Kaido? Renjiro inquired, both of us. Sara shyly answered. Sigh. Fine. Where do you want to go? Should we use the clan training grounds or the academy grounds? Let's use the academy one since they are nearer. Okay, I'll be in training ground 5 in 10 minutes. Thank you, Renjiro. Sara said as she scurried to her brother. This will be troublesome. Renjiro thought as he made his way to the academy training grounds. The academy training grounds was a new privilege they unlocked when they reached their second year at the academy. There was no need for it since their first year mainly focused on workouts. It was not like the academy training grounds were better than the one of the clan, the convenience of it being closer to the academy made it more suitable for the situation. It did not take long for the siblings to arrive and join Renjiro at training ground 5. 
So, what do you guys need help with? Renjiro inquired. We'd like you to help us with our weapon throwing. Yes, I know that, but what exactly? Kunai's, shurikens, or the Sanban? Why don't we just start with all of them? Okay, but why don't you guys first show me what you can do? Following his words, the siblings took a set of kunais and threw them at some targets nearby. Well, at least they tried their best. So there's that. But this is going to take a lot of work. Is it that bad? Sara asked after she saw the look on Renjiro's face. It'd be better if we'd had the Sharingan like you. Kaido chimed in. Ooh really? Renjiro said as he took a set of kunais and threw them. Thud. Swish. Thunk. This was without the Sharingan. Yeah, it helps but don't ever use it as an excuse for mediocrity. Plus awakening it, comes at the cost of powerful emotions good or worse. It's even worse for the Mangekyo Sharingan. What's the Mangekyo Sharingan? Kaido asked. Damn. I slipped up. Don't worry about it. Let's get back to what brought us here, Renjiro began, adopting a more straightforward tone. When you throw these weapons, think about two things, how heavy they are and how fast you want them to go. Kunais are a bit heavier, so you'll need to put some muscle into your throw to make sure they reach the target. But don't overdo it. You want enough force to hit the mark without losing control. Moving on to the shurikens, Renjiro continued, shurikens are lighter, so they don't need as much force. You want to give them a good spin to keep them stable in the air and make sure they hit the target flat. Finally, he turned to the senbons, senbons are like throwing darts. They're small and light, so you don't need to throw them hard. Focus on your aim and precision. Renjiro watched as understanding dawned on Sora and Kaido's faces, relieved that his explanation had resonated with them. Remember, practice makes perfect, so don't get discouraged if you don't nail it on the first try. So let's go again. Unknown to Renjiro, there was a pair of eyes watching what they were doing at the training grounds. How does he know about the Mangekyo? The figure wondered. Today, we will study ninjutsu, Ruji sensei said. This single remark threw the whole class, apart from Renjiro, into a buzz. He had already learned the three general academy jutsus. Renjiro had even managed to reduce the hand signs required to perform them to only one hand sign. The clan kids in the class were the most elated of the bunch. This was because they would finally have an avenue to show off as they had already been exposed to ninjutsu and even learned some. Ruji looked around the class, he studied the various expressions on his students' faces and sighed. The clan kids already have their chests puffed. This is going to be tiring, before continuing, first, we will go through the 12 basic hand signs required to perform any jutsu. Ruji's voice drifted off as Renjiro began thinking of ways in which he could improve his ninjutsu. The basic ninjutsu system, that Renjiro managed to dig out from various media, was simplified into four basic steps. At inception, the foundational step was nature manipulation. It involved understanding and harnessing the raw power of chakra. Basic chakra manipulation laid the groundwork, teaching one to mold and gather chakra within their bodies. Basic chakra control ensured that the chakra was directed precisely, allowing one to maintain balance and finesse in their techniques. This foundational stage served as the foundation of ninjutsu. This is what Renjiro had been practicing ever since he joined the academy. He had started to use chakra to change forms of a piece of clay and could now do the same for the ground although it was quite negligible because there was a jutsu that could do that. The great fireball jutsu that Miwa taught me helped me master fire manipulation by forcing me to skip some stages. He had mastered only fire, wind and earth nature manipulation in order of proficiency. Renjiro realized that he was not realistic when he set the goal for himself. He had failed to consider some variables. Factors like chakra affinities and nature weakness came into play as he failed to learn lightning and water nature manipulations. The former was due to chakra affinity, while the latter was due to his strongest affinity being weaker against water. His chakra control had improved greatly with his sensor training. It turns out that learning to sense the chakra in objects helped him better his control of his chakra reserves. The second step was nature transformation. Where intermediate chakra manipulation, as Renjiro had termed it, became paramount, demanding a refined mastery over chakra. This stage compelled one to delve into the essence of their elemental affinity. Their chakra control is forced to evolve, adapting to the nuances of molding chakra into elemental forms. Nature transformation opened the door to a spectrum of jutsu tailored to the chosen element. There was a pseudo-step that existed between this step and the next step, which Renjiro failed to come up with a term for it. This involved adding yin and yang elements to nature transformation. This was the source of all non-elemental techniques, such as the shadow imitation technique from the Nara clan, the multi-size technique from the Akimichi clan, medical ninjutsu, and even jinjutsu. 
The yin release is based on the spiritual energy of a shinobi, while the yang release is based on the physical energy of a shinobi. Together, they are used to perform the shadow and light style. The transformations of yin and yang has to do with altering the balance between spiritual and physical energy in chakra. The third step was nature release. Advanced chakra manipulation becomes a necessity, requiring one to sculpt and manifest their chosen nature with finesse. At this stage, a shinobi transcends the limitations of basic elemental jutsu, harnessing the environment to their advantage. Intermediate chakra control ensures a delicate balance and enables the execution of intricate techniques without compromising the ninja stability. Nature release embodies the art of commanding the very elements, leading to the birth of various styles such as fire release, katan, water release, suetun, wind release, futon, earth release, doton, lightning release, raitun. For those blessed with unique hereditary gifts, in the form of advanced nature transformation, commonly known as Kekiai Genkai and Kekiai Tota, this stage demands nothing short of mastery of advanced chakra manipulation, allowing the shinobi to fuse multiple elemental natures into unprecedented forms. Advanced chakra control becomes imperative as the complexities of Kekiai Genkai require a level of precision that surpasses all prior stages. Meitarumi's lava and boil release was an example of this step as Kekiai Genkai and the Tsuchikij's dust release was an instance of Kekiai Tota. Besides the advanced chakra control and manipulation needed to reach this step, luck also plays an important factor in this. Otherwise, Hiruzen, the professor of shinobi, who had mastered all of the five chakra natures would have numerous Kekiai Genkai. The easiest way to learn the nature release must be learning more jutsus. After all, it is a tried and tested method. Renjiro surmised. Since I already have a fire release jutsu, I should probably learn a wind release one. Renjiro thought as he signed. Konoha is probably the worst place to look for wind jutsus as there are few notable ninja with wind chakra affinities. Even Naruto's jutsus were self-developed apart from the Raisingan. Maybe I could look for Minato and ask for pointers as he should now be a genin or a chunin at best. Realizing that he let his intrusive thoughts get the better of him, Renjiro decided to quickly shut that thought down, if I approach him, it would seem suspicious. Let me just wait and besides, I could always play the clan card and use Kushina to make our meeting less forced. After school, Renjiro visited the clan library in search of wind jutsus due to the scarcity of wind natures in Konoha. The clan had a lot of wind jutsus since most of them had been copied from Suna Shinobi. It took some effort, but Renjiro managed to shortlist the available jutsu to seven that more or less fit his preferences. For the first option, he considered the wind cutter technique, Futon, Renkuden. This jutsu would empower him to create razor-sharp blades of wind, a deadly arsenal to assail his foes and cut through impediments in his path. For close combat, the Gale Palm Jutsu, Futon, Kazakiri no Jutsu, beckoned. The technique would allow Renjiro to manipulate the air around his hand, fashioning a blade of wind for swift and precise strikes, emphasizing speed and agility. When it came to long-range fighting, the allure of explosive impact drew him to the Vacuum Sphere Jutsu, Futon, Kekai, Reku. This jutsu would grant him the ability to craft a sphere of compressed air, a versatile tool for both offense and defense, capable of launching towards enemies with devastating force. For swift assaults, Renjiro considered the air bullets jutsu, Futon, Kaze Dangon. This technique, focusing on rapid projectiles of wind, offered strategic advantages in battles where quick, precise strikes were paramount. Considering close combat, the tornado fist jutsu, Futon, Tatsumaki Kabushi, captivated his interest. By infusing his punches with swirling wind chakra, Renjiro could unleash a torrent of force, disorienting opponents and amplifying the impact of his blows. Wanting to work on his defense, Renjiro explored the wind cloak jutsu, Futon, Kaze no Mahu. This technique, shrouding him in a protective layer of wind chakra, not only deflected incoming attacks but also enhanced his overall agility, offering a dynamic edge in battle. To learn jutsu was air burst jutsu, Futon, Shinkatai Naihatsu, which was also a long-range technique, one had to focus on the air around them, and the user is capable of causing parts of the wind to burst suddenly, causing anything nearby to be knocked aside. The burst does not do any damage, however, and its primary purpose is to interrupt and leave the enemy open for further attacks. However, the bursts can only be created within a 20-meter radius of the user and only at spots they can see. Clearly assessing his options, Renjiro decided on the last jutsu, the air burst jutsu. All the jutsus were deranked as that was the topmost rank of jutsus Renjiro could access as an academy student. He did not mind, of course, as even an e-ranked jutsu could be lethal when used correctly. 
The air burst jutsu meets the criteria and the impact of the bursts depends on the amount of chakra used. Its low chakra cost is a plus making it easy to spam this in a battle. It can also be used to stun opponents but that comes at the cost of large chakra consumption. Combining this with the great fireball jutsu could cause quite the damage. Rinjiro could not help but smirk at the thought of that. As Rinjiro was learning air burst jutsu, he realized that wind release was not as straightforward as fire release. When he was learning his first elemental jutsu, he only needed to perform the hand signs and voila he activates the jutsu. Well, it was not that straightforward, but I am sure you get the gist of it. The difference between the two nature releases was that Renjiro had to first learn some E-ranked jutsus before proceeding to the air burst. Was it because I was discharging fire from my mouth, but for this, I have to release chakra and convert it to wine nature? Anyway, this gives me a chance to build a solid foundation, so I can't complain. The jutsus that he had to learn were wind levitation, projectile control, wind retrieving jutsu and gale jutsu. These are not deadly jutsu. When compared to other jutsus, they aren't really all that useful in combat either. Rather, in my opinion, they are a way to enhance the element of wind control. They seem like they'll be crucial as I start studying more intricate and potent wind jutsu in the future. In essence, wind levitation is the use of winds to lift inanimate objects into the air. The user's ability to manage the wind element, along with their endurance and concentration, determines the weight of the object that can be levitated, the height to which it can be lifted, and the duration of the levitation. Projectile control jutsu controls the projectiles thrown around the user with wind. Thus, one can use wind to shift the course of a shuriken, kunai, or sunban. With wind retrieving jutsu, one can draw objects in the direction of oneself. It is comparable to Nagato's universal pull, except it depends totally on the person for power and is accomplished with the aid of winds. Gale jutsu, just merely directs a tiny wind flow in a certain direction. It has a few beneficial purposes but does no harm. It can be used to block out any traces of footfall or to alter the direction of the wind surrounding you, limiting the distance your scent can travel. Furthermore, it most likely acts as a foundation for all wind release jutsus that involve blowing out air. Renjiro groaned, ending his analysis with the thought, I'll have to master all these jutsus. Not just for combat, but to strengthen my wind control. Having said that, levitation, control, and retrieving are all great pranking techniques. I question whether or not the people who created these were practical jokers. After getting the basics down, he left the library and on arriving in a secluded mini forest, Renjiro began his practice. The experience was not what he expected. He managed to learn the four jutsus in one or two tries. It was easy. Almost too easy. Was it supposed to be that easy? Or am I just that talented? At this rate, Itachi might be compared to me in the future haha. Now that he was done with the warm-up, he focused on the air burst jutsu, meticulously breaking down the process into distinct stages, each presenting its unique challenges. In the initial stage, he focused on releasing chakra from his body, a fundamental aspect of many jutsu. The challenge lay in maintaining a steady and controlled flow, laying the groundwork for the subsequent phases. Transitioning to the second stage, Renjiro delved into the art of converting his chakra into wind nature. The challenge intensified as he grappled with the delicate balance required to bestow the chakra with the specific nature needed for the air burst jutsu. The heart of the technique unfolded in the third stage, where Renjiro immersed himself in the manipulation of air molecules present in the air. His keen understanding of physics played a pivotal role as he harnessed the principles of molecular vibration, seeking to amplify the explosive potential through kinetic energy. The challenge now lay in fine-tuning the intensity of the bursts and finding the delicate balance between power and precision. As Renjiro navigated these stages, two overarching challenges emerged. Firstly, the precision of chakra control needed to be intricate, requiring him to navigate the fine line between underwhelming bursts and uncontrolled explosions. The second challenge revealed itself in a crucial realization, the purported low chakra consumption applied to only those who had mastered the jutsu. In the learning phase, Renjiro discovered that achieving mastery was a gradual process, demanding a fair amount of chakra expenditure in the initial stages. This revelation heightened the stakes, compelling him to optimize his chakra usage without compromising the effectiveness of the air burst jutsu. Meanwhile, as Renjiro was training, something else was happening in another part of Konoha. In the Hokage's building, the academy head instructor, Hiroshi Nagatomo, ascended the stairs, with his destination being the Hokage's office. Upon entering, the vastness of the office struck him despite him entering it numerous times, adorned with scrolls, ceremonial weapons, and the emblematic Hokage hat. In the center, behind a sturdy desk, sat the third Hokage, Hiruzen Sarutobi, head of the Sarutobi clan. 
Hiroshi, it is good to see you, Haruzan said when Hiroshi entered the office. Hiroshi approached with a respectful bow, thank you, Hokage-sama, I have come to report on the progress of our academy students. Hiruzen, his expression a mix of curiosity, gestured for Hiroshi to proceed. So, Hiroshi. How are the future pillars of the village faring? The first-year students are adapting to the basics remarkably well, Hiroshi began. Their understanding of fundamental knowledge and chakra control is promising. We've identified several with potential in taijutsu and basic ninjutsu. Are they all clan kids? Hiruzen questioned. No, although most of them are, there are some talented civilian kids in the lot, Hiroshi answered. The Hokage's gaze remained attentive, encouraging Hiroshi to continue. As for the second-year students, the shift to more practical training has invigorated them. Their taijutsu, ninjutsu, and other classes are progressing smoothly, and we've seen unique talents emerging, particularly in elemental affinities. Hiruzen's interest deepened. Who are these unique students? Hiroshi nodded as he said, among them are Uzumaki Renjiro, Inazuka Siba, Hyuga Kenta and Hayori are showing exceptional promise. Their mastery of taijutsu and ninjutsu is notable, and their exceptional performance in the other classes solidifies their prowess as the top students from their year. Uzumaki Renjiro? That must be the new kid Daichi is trying to integrate into the Uchiha clan. I see. Not bad at all. Hiruzen thought. The Hokage's eyes gleamed with a mixture of pride and intrigue. Good. What about the third-year students? The third-year students are excelling in advanced techniques and tactics, Hiroshi reported. Their applications of what we have been teaching them are noteworthy. We have some who exhibit prowess in Jinjutsu and others displaying exceptional teamwork in strategic scenarios. And, my thought process for the academy only being three years was that they have just come out of the Second Shinobi War and peace is not yet guaranteed, so they still have to recover and bolster their ranks. Hiruzen leaned forward, and the overall atmosphere in the academy? How do the students view their training? Hiroshi considered the question before responding. The students are enthusiastic, Hokage-sama. They understand the importance of their role in protecting the village. Hiruzen nodded approvingly. Excellent. Hiroshi, in light of our recovery from the war, we need to ensure the village's security. Are there any students who show such exceptional promise that they might qualify for early graduation? Hiroshi paused, reflecting on the students he had observed. There are a few, Hokage-sama. Renjiro and Hyuga Kenta, for instance, could be considered. Their proficiency in both offense and sensory abilities makes him a potential asset to our forces. Hiruzen steepled his fingers, deep in thought. Proceed with the evaluations, Hiroshi. But first, ask them, because there is no need to force them to take the early graduation exam when they feel they aren't ready. Although we do need to bolster our ranks swiftly, we have to keep in mind the morale of our shinobi. Hiroshi bowed respectfully. As you command, Hokage-sama. I will ask those who are ready for early graduation. With that, Nagatomo Hiroshi took his leave. As he left, Hiruzen, was in deep thought. Sensei, the village is doing well. Our will of fire is still burning brightly and hopefully, we will pass it to the next generation. Renjiro's chest rose and fell rhythmically, a testament to the intensity of his recent workout. Beads of sweat glistened on his forehead. He wiped the sweat from his brow with the back of his hand, feeling the cool residue against his heated skin. The training had pushed his body to its limits, testing his endurance and resilience. The sensation of accomplishment mingled with fatigue, creating a satisfying blend of weariness and fulfillment. With a final, cleansing breath, Renjiro straightened his posture. The training may have left him heaving, but it also left him one step closer to mastering his abilities. It had been a long and tiresome couple of months, but Renjiro made the most of it. He had managed to perfect his taijutsu and ninjutsu. The airburst jutsu that he learned, had already been integrated into his fighting style. Renjiro found the integration of the airburst jutsu into his fighting style to be a formidable challenge. The technique required a delicate balance between chakra manipulation and timing, and mastering it was no easy feat the initial attempts were met with a series of missteps and mistimed releases. Renjiro had to refine the synchronization between his movements and the bursts of air, a process that demanded patience and precision. Combining the air burst jutsu with his fire release presented an additional layer of complexity. Each element required precise control, and the challenge lay in harmonizing the two disparate natures. Renjiro grappled with the intricacies of intertwining gusts of wind with the intensity of flames, striving for a synergy that would enhance both elements in unison. However, with each setback came a lesson, and Renjiro persisted through the trials. He adjusted his timing, fine-tuned his chakra control, and gradually found the equilibrium he sought. 
The breakthroughs were accompanied by moments of realization, as he discovered the nuanced interplay between the two elements. He had to perfect his timing to the exact second the fireball jutsu made contact with his target. The combination of the two jutsus added a whole layer of versatility as he could always change the size of the fireball he used. This meant that if he used a large one and his opponent decided to dodge it, he could apply the air burst on the jutsu and his opponent could be caught unaware of the explosion's impact. The same could be done with smaller fireballs which could be akin to mini explosions. It was quite an effective combination that Renjiro was sure his opponents would find really annoying. The impact range remained the same even with the low chakra cost. Renjiro's progress in sensory training was remarkable. Under the guidance of Sato Yamanaka, the expanse of Renjiro's chakra field had expanded to an impressive radius of over 20 meters. This newfound range allowed him to perceive the chakra signatures of those around him with heightened clarity and precision. He had also learned the other two exercises required for sensory ninjas. They were chakra harmony and feedback. Chakra harmony helped a sensory ninja attune their chakra to the environment thereby erasing it. It was not to the level of the second Suchikage Mu or even some of the Otsutsukis. It was at best, a cheap knockoff. But considering how Jiraiya and Itachi improved it, it had immense potential. Chakra feedback allowed a shinobi to have proficiency in chakra signature detection and manipulation, crucial for tasks such as neutralizing opposing chakra sources and adapting their own techniques to exploit elemental weaknesses. Sato acknowledged Renjiro's substantial advancement and expressed his satisfaction with the young ninja's development. He recognized that Renjiro had reached a point where he could continue his sensory training independently, no longer requiring constant oversight. This acknowledgement came as both a validation of Renjiro's dedication and a testament to his innate talent in sensory perception. As Sato conveyed the news, a sense of accomplishment washed over Renjiro. The journey had not been easy after all. The constant taijutsu spars in the academy also served as a crucible for Renjiro, forging his skills and elevating his combat prowess to new heights. Engaging in hand-to-hand -hand combat with fellow students became a routine that provided him with invaluable experience. Both literally and figuratively. Yes, he was superior to them in taijutsu but as mentioned before, Renjiro was working on his own taijutsu style. He wanted to form a taijutsu style from the best components of the existing styles in Konoha. It was a daunting task but not impossible. Sparring with the academy students, especially the clan kids, gave him a preview of the taijutsu styles of Konoha's shinobi clans. This was the only way he could accomplish his goal. Each spar was a lesson, an opportunity to refine his techniques, improve his reflexes, and understand the intricacies of different fighting styles. Whether facing off against the nimble agility of the likes of Kenta and Kaido or countering the strength and precision of the Inazuka triplets, each encounter contributed to his growth as a formidable combatant. In addition to Taijutsu, Renjiro dedicated time to perfecting his weapon-throwing skills. Renjiro's precision and accuracy with throwing weapons improved through relentless practice, transforming him into a skilled marksman. He no longer needed to rely on his Sharingan for any of the weapons they handled. Whether it was kunai, shuriken, or other projectile weapons, Renjiro's proficiency in their use became an integral part of his combat repertoire. Another boon that Renjiro received was a slight upgrade to his dojitsu. His eyes were now fully matured by clan standards after he got his third tomo. It did not bring that much of a change but his abilities and their fluidity deepened. Wasn't it supposed to progress through intense emotions? Or was my little training arc that intense? Anyway, it is still good to have it. Now how the hell am I going to get a Mangekyo Sharingan? I do not have a close blood relative alive. So I should forget about the EMS. And, thoughts on this? Anyway, it is such a waste to have such powerful options when I am stuck being an academy student. Fortunately, I only have one year left so let me just push through it. All in all, everything was going on fine and every student was busy with preparations for their final exams for their second year at the academy. That was why it was a shock when Ruji informed them of the option of early graduation. In the bustling atmosphere of the academy, all the students from the first to third years were diligently preparing for their end-of-year exams. The first and second years were preparing for the usual last exams of the year while the third years were preparing for their genin exams. It was during this tense time for the students that Ruji Mataka, a homeroom instructor, dropped an unexpected bombshell on his students. The announcement rippled through the air, causing whispers and exchanged glances among the surprised students. Ruji stood at the front of the class, his presence commanding attention. He cleared his throat as the room fell silent. Good morning, class. I have an important announcement, Ruji began, his tone carrying a mix of gravity and excitement. 
The village has decided to open the application for early graduation to exceptional students who show outstanding progress. This is an opportunity for those who feel ready to step into the next phase of their ninja careers ahead of schedule. The unexpected revelation hung in the air, and a murmur of surprise and curiosity swept through the students. Early graduation? It's about time. This saves me one year of academy stress and time wasting. I really don't think that there is anything they can offer me at this point. So sign me up. Ruji scanned the room, gauging the reactions of his students. This isn't a decision to be taken lightly. Early graduation means you'll be entering the field sooner than your peers. It's a chance to prove yourselves as capable shinobi and contribute to the village's well-being. If any of you are interested, there will be an application process. Discuss it with your families and guardians. As the realization sank in, questions and whispers filled the room. Amidst the buzzing excitement and uncertainty, Ruji left the room with a parting message, think this over, discuss it with your parents and guardians and let me know if you choose to pursue this path. The choice is yours, and it's a significant one. Good luck. Do I need to consult my guardian? Well, Miwa is not around at the moment so who should I talk to about this? Let's hope that the academy will understand my situation. Maybe I am being a bit rash. They could still be useful things that I could learn during my third year. I should first go through the syllabus, then decide. Once Renjiro thought things through, he became conflicted. On one hand, the allure of early graduation beckoned with promises of utilizing his advanced skills and making a tangible impact on the village. He knew that the third shinobi war was inevitable. So graduating early would at least give him one more year of on-field experience. This would of course benefit him greatly. Yet, amidst the allure, a nagging doubt whispered within the recesses of his mind. The academy, with its structured curriculum, offered more than just practical skills. It was a crucible of strategic thinking, aspects Renjiro feared he might miss out on if he chose the path of early graduation. The prospect of entering the field with incomplete training left a lingering unease, a concern that the foundation of his abilities might be somewhat shaky. On one side, the eagerness to embrace the challenges of the real world, and on the other, the recognition of the academy's role in sculpting a well-rounded shinobi. The decision, it seemed, was not merely about skill and speed but a delicate balance between the allure of the unknown and the comfort of familiar grounds. Am I ready to be a genin? Well, I am sure my power level is genin level or even higher. But sparing and training is one thing, fighting in the field is a whole other thing. The risk is just too much. I can't keep talking about risks, I should have already made peace with it when I realized which world I had gotten into. Delaying this won't help as eventually I will have to do what I gotta do to survive. Hopefully, I do get a good Jounin Sensei when I become a Genin. Renjiro approached Ruji immediately after class and asked him about the application process for early graduation. You need to have your parent or guardian's permission to apply for the Genin exams. Ruji clarified. Welp, it is as I thought. But what if you have neither of those Ruji, Sama? Why was I inconsiderate? I should have remembered that he is an orphan. Wait doesn't he stay at the Uchiha clan compound? Don't you have a guardian in the Yukia clan? Yes I do but she has not been in the village for some time. I guess they are probably on a mission. If he was a civilian orphan then the process would be easier. Then you should probably approach your clan head, it will make things easier for you. Okay, Ruji-sama. I will do so. It's been a while since I saw the clan head. I am sure it's been more than a year. I just hope that this will not bring any issues. In the evening, Renjiro made his way to the main hall of the Uchiha clan. It had been a while since he had been there but there were minimal changes to the building. Renjiro was still an academy student, so he was not serving on the police force or old enough to attend the clan meetings, heck he wasn't even using the Uchiha name, so he hadn't had a lot of interactions with the building or even the clan head. After three rapid knocks on the door, Renjiro heard Daichi's husky voice asking him to enter. When he entered, he was met with Daichi and Fugaku who were clearly discussing an important matter. Fugaku is here. I guess the process of succession has already started. But Fugaku has a little brother. Does that matter or is the decision clear cut? Renjiro. How are you? Daichi politely inquired. I am doing well Daichi-sama, that's good to know. How can I help you? I know you did not come just because you missed this old man's company. Daichi said with a burst of brisk laughter, prompting his son and Renjiro to also follow suit. Today at the academy, our instructor Ruji-sama informed us about the option of early graduation. I wanted to apply for it, but I was told I needed a guardian's consent. Since Miwa is not around, he advised me to come and see you. As Renjiro was explaining his situation, Daichi and Fugaku shared a look. It was so brief that if Renjiro was not as perceptible as he was, he would not have noticed it all. 
That is good news Renjiro. I have also heard of your good performance at the academy. But are you sure you want to graduate early? Yes, Ryuji-sama. I have carefully thought about it. I am ready. Renjiro had the whole day to think about this. He concluded that not taking this opportunity would be very counterproductive. It is good that you have quite the resolve Renjiro. Even Fugaku here graduated early so do not think that it is strange. If you are good enough to pass the exams, then you are old enough to be a genin. Renjiro thanked him as he received the slip that required the guardian's permission. Thank god that barely took minutes. I should get back to training. Since no business kept him in Daichi's office, Renjiro bid them goodbye and excused himself. As he left, Fugaku posed a question to his father that he had yet to understand. Father, I know that you wanted him to be a part of the clan so that his Sharingan remains in the clan, but he does not even use our name. Why are we still allowing him to use the clan's resources? Fugaku was not asking the question because he felt some sort of way towards Renjiro leeching of the clan. In fact, he did not have any sort of feelings about the situation. What he wanted to know was the meaning behind his father's strange action. He had seen his father treat some of his people way harsher, so he was not sure that his father suddenly became sentimental or generous. Fugaku, why do you think we discourage and not prohibit intermarrying between our clan and outsiders? It is because they rarely awaken the Sharingan and if they do, they still have problems developing it or showing any talent at using it. Exactly. But Renjiro is a special case, not only has it shown the normal behavior but his Sharingan is now fully matured. What? Fugaku exclaimed, to show that talent at such an age. Fugaku was shocked because he only got his third Tomo when he was a genin. He was an exception Jounin, so he knew how much potential Renjiro had if his Sharingan fully matured even before becoming a genin. That is just the tip of the iceberg, Daichi added, I have people who closely monitor him. With his talent, I will not be surprised if he inherited some of the Uzumaki benefits. He will be a powerful piece in the future, so we need to try our best to tie him to the clan. I was even thinking of arranging a marriage between him and your younger sister. Daichi did not know but the single decision to take in Renjiro forever changed the destiny of the Uchiha clan. Whether it would be for the good or worse, only time would tell. Renjiro joined the small cohort of aspirants for early graduation as they submitted their applications to Ruji the following day. How are you Renjiro? Aiko Nakamura greeted Renjiro upon seeing him joining them. The group consisted of Aiko, Hei Nara, Hiro Hataki and Makoto Inazuka. I'm good, Renjiro replied back similarly before asking, is this everyone? It's surprising that Kenta and Hayori are not applying for early registration. But then again, Sara and Kaido too, aren't applying for it. Yes, we are just waiting for Ruji-sama, Aiko replied. What about you Makoto, are your siblings not applying? Renjiro asked Makoto seeing that her siblings, Mitsuki and Siba were not there. They're just a bunch of sissies, plus delaying will just be a drag. It's better to just be done with it, Nara Heiate interjected. Is the laziness in their clan genetic? Renjiro could not help but smile. With a composed demeanor, Ruji Mataka arrived to review the applications for early graduation. You've made a bold choice, he remarked, his voice carrying a blend of pride and responsibility. As you've chosen the path of early graduation, there are a few adjustments we need to discuss, Ruji explained, locking eyes with each student. Firstly, your second year exams will be skipped. Instead, you will only undergo the graduation assessment in a month. As expected. Well, not technically since I was preparing for two exams back to back. I was sure that they would have a catch to this so as to sift the wheat from the chaff. I guess I was wrong. Ruji continued, this also means that you should be prepared to brush over the third year syllabus. While it won't be the main focus, it might be integrated into the examination. What the hell? I thought that since the third years have more practical classes than us, their syllabus wouldn't be that different from ours. I guess I'll have to ask around. The weight of the challenge settled in the room, but Ruji's stern expression softened as he addressed them. I believe in your capabilities, and this decision shows your dedication. Ruji finished off with an encouraging smile. He handed each student a set of papers outlining the revised plan, the details of the accelerated exams, and a brief overview of the third-year syllabus. Ruji watched them go, and his confidence in their potential was evident. The journey to early graduation had begun, and each step would test their mettle and shape their destinies as shinobi. Ah, to be so young and ambitious. I just hope that neither of them will get discouraged if they fail the test. Who am I kidding? Not everyone is like me. Ruji finished off with a short laugh at his misery. This brought back memories of his younger days and he could not help but be sentimental. When Renjiro arrived back at his place, the first thing that he did was release one long exasperated sigh. Ugh.
I can't even get rest nowadays. Maybe I should just quit being a shinobi and live a mundane life after the next shinobi war. There would be more than 20 years of peace. However, there is also the Uchiha clan massacre. I can just become strong enough to be able to protect myself. But becoming stronger opens one up to stronger threats after all more power, more problems. After resigning himself to his fate of a never-ending loop of power chasing just for self-preservation, Renjiro focused on the matter at hand. Well good news is I have more time to prepare for the exams and the bad news is that I have a month to go through the third year curriculum. Life sure has a way of balancing itself out. Besides that, the only other things that I consider important are Jinjutsu and Bukijutsu. But considering the tight time constraint, I can't learn everything about them. I will have to cover the basics and then circle back after I become a genin. Or even, I could even pester my Jounin sensei to teach me. But first, let me see what the third year curriculum entails. Renjiro furled the papers Ruji handed to them and started studying them one after another. In their third year at the academy, the curriculum shifted its focus to practical applications. Each student embarked on a journey to refine their skills and develop a more profound understanding of their abilities. Throughout the year, students participated in simulated missions and practical scenarios, challenging their chosen specializations. The curriculum emphasized teamwork and collaborative strategies, preparing the students for the dynamic challenges they would face as genin. The culmination of the year involved a comprehensive examination evaluating their proficiency in both their chosen specialization and overall ninja skills. Great, they cover ways of countering Jinjutsus. I should probably focus on that. The first should be Chakra Disruption. Renjiro surmised. Renjiro explored intentional chakra disruption as a countermeasure. By strategically interfering with his own chakra flow, he could create a defense mechanism that rendered Jinjutsu ineffective, or at the very least, minimize the chance of him falling under one as they had different intensities. Renjiro also sharpened his sensory perception and awareness, aiming to recognize subtle chakra fluctuations in his surroundings. His gains in sensory training greatly helped. This heightened awareness became a crucial tool, enabling him to detect and dispel Jinjutsu before it tightened its grip on him. Through a combination of mental fortitude, chakra mastery, and heightened awareness Renjiro emerged more resilient and adept in countering the artful deceptions of Jinjutsu. Well, that went well. I am not completely immune to Jinjutsu but at least I now have ways to defend against them. On to the next. Mastering Bukijutsu isn't just about wielding weapons, it's a pathway to versatility and adaptability in the unpredictable realm of combat. Weapons are extensions of a shinobi skills, amplifying their prowess and offering strategic advantages in diverse situations. As he considered the specific weapons to delve into, Renjiro found himself drawn to the idea of mastering the staff or the saber. He envisioned the staff as a versatile choice, providing both offense and defense through its extended reach and blocking capabilities. The staff offers a dynamic range of techniques. It can be a swift, striking force or a reliable tool for parrying and deflecting attacks. Its versatility aligns with my goal of cultivating a well-rounded skill set. Plus, ever since I saw the Monkey King summon of the Hokage wielded, I was hooked. The saber, on the other hand, appealed to Renjiro for its finesse and precision. The saber, with its sharp and swift movements, embodies a more refined approach to Bukijutsu. It allows for precise strikes and quick maneuvers, emphasizing agility and speed. A well-mastered saber technique can be a potent asset in close quarters combat. Plus, if I am lucky I can, I can get lessons from Sukumo. He should be the guy in Kanoha during this time. Renjiro envisioned the symbiotic relationship between his existing skills and Bukijutsu, recognizing that a comprehensive arsenal, both physical and metaphoric, would elevate him as a shinobi. Since the use of the staff and the saber were not that common in Kanoha, save for a few clans like the Hataki clan, the only place where Renjiro could get the weapons art was in Kanoha's public library. This is strange, I thought with their Sharingans, the Uchiha could have easily copied weapon arts and other techniques of even the samurai. On reaching the library, since there was low demand for such arts, there were fewer scrolls on weapon arts and Renjiro only managed to get one for the staff. Although this might be unexpected, I can practice the staff in private for whenever I need to perform clandestine missions for the village or even personal ones. I can leave the saber for whenever I get the chance to learn from somebody. The morning sun cast a warm glow over the village hidden in the leaves as the second-year students assembled in their classroom in anticipation of the graduation exam. Renjiro was the last to arrive among the group. After a short round of greetings, Ruji arrived and led them to where the exam would be taking place. He briefed them on the format. The final exams would consist of four stages. 
The first stage would be a written exam, similar to the end-of-year exams of prior years. It was a test of their theoretical knowledge and strategic acumen. It was to be held at another venue so they hastily set out for the venue. Arriving at the exam venue, a spacious hall resonating with the rustling of the occasional murmur of discussions, Rinjiro felt a mix of determination and anticipation. The corridors were crowded as there were different batches of the same exam taking the exam as well as the second year group. As Renjiro and his group made their way through the bustling corridors, he couldn't help but notice the hushed murmurs that trailed in his wake. The source of the commotion became evident as snippets of conversations reached his ears, all centered around the distinctive feature that set him apart, his striking red hair. Did you see his hair? Red, isn't it strange? I've never seen anything like it in Kanoha. Have you forgotten about Lady Kushina? Yes, he must be from the Uzumaki clan. But wasn't their village destroyed some years ago? Maybe there were some survivors. Whispers echoed with curiosity and speculation as fellow students exchanged glances and pointed discreetly at the vibrant cascade of crimson that adorned Renjiro's head. The vivid hue seemed to evoke a spectrum of reactions, ranging from admiration to intrigue. The sea of typical black and brown-haired shinobi had found an anomaly in Renjiro's flamboyant mane. Some openly stared, their eyes widening with surprise, while others discreetly discussed the unconventional sight. Yes. Bask in the shadow of my handsomeness. Renjiro, aware of the attention, moved forward with a stoic expression, his demeanor unaffected by the spotlight cast upon him while he inwardly gloated. Renjiro. The familiar voice echoed through the air, drawing Renjiro's attention. Inabi, Yashiro, and Teka Uchiha, the trio of upperclassmen he had encountered back at the clan workshop, approached the group. Look who we have here, Inabi greeted with a sly grin, I could not believe it when Sora told us, but you really decided to apply for the early graduation. Yes, I talked it over with Daichi-sama and he allowed me to. But don't let that get in your head, even if you become genins with us, we will still be your seniors, Inabi added. All this was in good spirits. The trio had interacted with Renjiro before and couldn't deny the fact that he was talented. In fact, they would have been more surprised if Renjiro had chosen to stay at the academy. Yashiro with his arms crossed, nodded knowingly. So are you nervous about the exams? Renjiro's group exchanged glances, it was already clear that they were nervous. This was basically a test that could determine their life. Tekka, the quietest of the trio, broke his silence to offer reassurance, don't let the nerves get to you. Just think of it as another step in your journey. However, their exchange was cut short by a booming voice that resonated across the area. All right, young shitheads, time to head in. The authoritative voice boomed. The voice belonged to Yaza Kurama, the jonin proctor overseeing the exams. Yaza Kurama, a seasoned jonin with a stern countenance, stood tall and imposing as the proctor overseeing the graduation exams. Adorned in traditional jonin attire, with a forehead protector proudly displaying the symbol of Kanoha, Kurama emanated an air of authority tempered by a sense of responsibility. Despite the formidable exterior, there was a pearl of subtle wisdom in his gaze, reflecting the seasoned mentor entrusted with shaping the future of Kanoha's new generation. Ruji quickly bid them farewell and with a final nod from Inabi, Yashiro, and Tekka, Renjiro and his peers turned their attention toward the looming exam hall. The examination hall was a spacious room filled with anticipation. Rows of desks neatly arranged, each candidate took their seat, nerves and an excitement palpable in the air. Are we going to have to copy the test? Or is that too advanced for a genin exam? With a swift efficiency that mirrored his commanding presence, they were handed their exam papers. The rustling of paper echoed through the hall as each student received their set of questions. Begin. Yaza's booming voice cut through the hushed whispers, signaling the start of the exam. Pen scratched against the paper as the candidates delved into the challenges presented before them. Renjiro tackled the questions with a mix of confidence and diligence, the pen dancing across the page as he drew on his acquired knowledge from training. As time ticked away, the students wrestled with the questions. The paper was a multi-choice one and its duration was two hours long. The questions were pretty straightforward. So even if you did not know the answer you still had a 25% chance of getting it right. The test covered a wide range of topics from tactics and strategy to math to geography and even physics among others. Basically, all theory that the students had learned in their time at the academy. As the air in the examination hall grew dense, and Renjiro's heightened senses picked up on an unusual disturbance. An instinctive warning prompted him to activate his Sharingan, its three tomos swirling to life, each red iris reflecting the world with enhanced clarity. To his astonishment, the entire hall seemed to be enveloped in a peculiar phenomenon. It appeared as if a thick shroud of smoke was permeating the surroundings. 
The other candidates, unaware of this occurrence, continued diligently working on their exams, oblivious to the anomaly unfolding around them. What the hell is this? It's cloudy as hell. Is that chakra? Renjiro's Sharingan, finely tuned to detect anomalies in chakra, intensified his perception. Gripped by a sense of foreboding, Renjiro focused his attention on deciphering the nature of this phenomenon, unsure of its origin or purpose. Recognition flickered in Renjiro's eyes as he noticed Inabi, Aiko, and other students sharing his perplexity. Aiko covertly made a hand sign and observing Aiko's hand sign, a revelation dawned on him. The peculiar phenomenon enveloping the examination hall was, in fact, a genjutsu. But when was it activated? I initially thought it was a genjutsu but when I looked at Yaza there were no chakra fluctuations within and around him. He's from the Kurama clan I should have expected this. Realizing that their peers were unwittingly ensnared in the genjutsu, Renjiro and the others found themselves at the forefront of an unexpected challenge. The urgency of the situation pressed upon them, amplifying the importance of swift and decisive action to dispel the illusion. Renjiro released his chakra, as a way to counter the genjutsu, his chakra slowly enveloped the area he was. This did not go unnoticed by Yaza. His eyes were sharp and discerning, missing nothing as he observed the hall of aspiring young shinobi. The Sharingan. Has he realized it? Yaza thought as he raised a brow. I need to help the rest, Renjiro thought as he continued releasing chakra into the environment. No. Renjiro did not have a false sense of justice. He only wanted to help the rest of his classmates so that they could be indebted to him. You never know where these favors could help you. He wanted to forcefully intrude on Hyates and Hero's chakra network with his chakra. He succeeded as the two boys suddenly the two boys had confused looks on their faces seeing Renjiro's actions, Inabi and Aiko did the same and like a domino the rest of the unaffected students followed. Aiko did the same for Makoto while Inabi helped his two friends. Seeing his ruse was exposed, Yaza shouted, put your pens. Down. Stand up and head out, they obediently did so and as they were getting out, but some of them were intentionally bumping into their friends in a bid to wake them from the genjutsu. Unfortunately for them, their attempts were futile as they did not wake up from the genjutsu. After all the students were outside, Yaza released the affected students from his genjutsu. Wakey, wakey shitheads. You have been disqualified from the exams. Yaza said while grinning. His gleaming perfect set of teeth added to the confusion of the students. The abrupt revelation left the affected students in a state of bewilderment, their confusion palpable in the hushed murmurs that circulated among them. One moment, they were diligently working on their exam papers, and the next, they found themselves confronted with the harsh reality of disqualification. Listen up, those of you caught in the genjutsu, he declared, addressing the bewildered students directly. The original intent was to encourage early submission, but something went awry. Unfortunately, you were ensnared, and breaking free proved difficult for you to release it. His gaze scanned the disheartened faces before him, the weight of disappointment evident in the air. Given the circumstances, disqualification is inevitable. The rules are clear, if you can't dispel the genjutsu, you can't continue. This was an unexpected challenge, but every shinobi must adapt to unforeseen obstacles. Learn from this experience, and perhaps you'll emerge stronger in the future. The gravity of his words hung in the air, acknowledging the unexpected turn of events and emphasizing the importance of resilience in the unpredictable world of shinobi. Outside the exam hall, the group huddled together, attempting to make sense of what had just transpired. Aiko, animatedly explained the intricacies of the genjutsu, revealing its reliance on their chakra. Renjiro furrowed his brow, contemplating the unexpected revelation. So, it used our own chakra against us? Is that why I couldn't sense any chakra fluctuation from Yaza? Very sneaky. Aiko nodded in agreement, her expression thoughtful. Exactly. It played on our focus on the exam, diverting our attention while subtly siphoning our chakra to sustain the illusion. Clever technique, really. Hiro chimed in, his voice reflecting a mix of frustration and curiosity. But how were we expected to counter something like that? It's not like we can sense our own chakra being manipulated. Renjiro sighed, rubbing his temples. True. It's a tricky one. We just need to figure out how to sense any chakra discrepancies around us. That's the key to breaking free from a genjutsu like this. Luckily for them, they managed to move to the next stage and no one from their group was disqualified. Yaza Kurama moved swiftly towards a group of Chunins trailing behind. They were assisting with the proceedings. How many students are left? Yaza's deep voice resonated. One of the Chunins, a young ninja with a clipboard in hand, quickly responded. Out of the initial 500 students, around 30% have been disqualified due to the genjutsu. Yaza's brows furrowed as he processed the numbers. 30%? 
That's still a significant portion. We need to quickly tally the scores and move to the next stage. The Chunin nodded, understood, Yaza sensei The students, now seated in restless patience, exchanged glances and murmurs as they awaited the return of their results. The results of the written exam were a critical component of each student's overall score, contributing significantly to their chances of success in the graduation exam. Two hours later, the tension in the air remained as the Chunins distributed the graded papers. The room echoed with the shuffling of papers and hushed conversations as the students eagerly scanned their assessments. This is better than I had expected. Renjiro remarked. He had gotten an 80 out of 100 marks. This was a good grade despite the fact that he only skimmed over the third year knowledge. The rest had done fairly well with their scores ranging from 65 to 80. Overall as long as they continued with the same momentum, they would surely pass the exams. The transition from the written exam to the second stage of the graduation assessment brought forth a myriad of challenges for the aspiring shinobis. As the students gathered at the designated testing grounds, the first test focused on shuriken proficiency, demanding precision and speed from the participants. Targets of varying distances awaited, each requiring a well-aimed shuriken to prove their throwing accuracy determining the students' capabilities in ranged combat. Stealth and infiltration became the next hurdle for the young ninjas. Navigating a course filled with traps and guards, they demonstrated their ability to move silently and unnoticed. The course tested their agility, strategic thinking, and mastery of the art of subterfuge, vital skills for any ninja operating in the shadows. Survival skills took the spotlight in the following test. Given a set of resources, the students were tasked with setting up a functional campsite in the wilderness. This segment delved into their understanding of basic survival techniques, resource management, and adaptability to the unpredictable challenges of the great outdoors. Chakra control challenges followed suit. The tests aimed to showcase not only the quantity but also the quality of the student's chakra manipulation. Renjiro and his fellow students showcased remarkable performances in the diverse array of tests that comprised the second stage of the graduation assessment. In the shuriken proficiency test, his high mastery of shuriken jutsu skill came in clutch and Renjiro's precision and agility stood out. He consistently hit targets with exceptional accuracy. During the stealth and infiltration test, the group demonstrated a seamless coordination of their skills. Renjiro's ability to navigate through the course with a blend of speed and subtlety showcased his adeptness in the art of covert movement. In the survival skills test, Renjiro's resourcefulness and adaptability shone through as he efficiently set up a functional campsite. The group's collaborative efforts in managing resources and handling the challenges of the wilderness reflected their aptitude for survival, a crucial attribute for ninjas operating in varied environments. Chakra control presented another arena where Renjiro distinguished himself. His precise manipulation of chakra in creating delicate structures underscored his mastery over this essential ninja skill. Overall, Renjiro demonstrated a well-rounded set of skills, excelling in various aspects of the second stage assessment. Unfortunately, not all of them would move to the next stage. The elimination of 94 students following the second stage of the graduation assessment cast a bittersweet shadow over the remaining participants. Among those unable to advance to the final stage was Makoto Inazuka, a member of the second-year group that Renjiro had trained with throughout the academy journey. The news of Makoto's elimination induced a somber within the group. Wasn't she the one calling her siblings pussies for not taking the exam? But I guess we admire triers. Renjiro thought. The next stage was Taijutsu and since there were a lot of students remaining, the battles would begin the following day. They would have to potentially fight eight battles if they wanted to come out on top during that stage of the examinations. As night fell, the candidates retreated to their respective quarters, contemplating the challenges that awaited them on the next day. The prospect of engaging in combat with their peers added a layer of excitement and nervous tension. The following day, the training grounds buzzed with an electric energy as the students, clad in their training gear, readied themselves for the imminent taijutsu battles. The morning air was crisp, carrying with it the weight of anticipation and the subtle rustle of leaves. In a notable turn of events, the Hokage himself graced the occasion, his imposing presence casting a hush over the training grounds. The news of the village leader attending the taijutsu trial spread like wildfire among the students, adding an extra layer of significance to the battles about to unfold. But he was not alone, he was accompanied by another man. The man had spiky, silver-colored hair that reached into the middle of his back tied in a ponytail and bangs that hung over his forehead protector. He wore a standard Konohanin uniform with a pair of gloves, a flak jacket, bandages on his right arm, and the addition of a distinctive short white sleeve which had red edges and the standard crest of Yuzushiogakure on it. Hmm? This guy looks familiar. Where have I seen him? 
Wait is that who I think it is? Rinjiro could not help but blurt out. The man Rinjiro was referring to was erringly familiar to one Hitaki Kakashi, the famed copy ninja and the future sixth Hokage of the Hidden Leaf. The similarity between the two was uncanny. Almost terrifying. That must be Hitaki Sakumo, without a doubt, Renjiro concluded. He was known as White Fang of the Leaf. His genius-level intellect and fighting prowess made him a thorn in every elemental nation's backside. Him being an S-rank ninja, even stronger than the famous Sanins, made his name feared throughout the lands. It could not have been Kakashi. Besides, if I remember correctly, he must be a toddler right now. But I wonder what he is doing here. Sakumo, who was walking with Hiruzen, felt a tiny prickling sensation on his skin. He could tell that someone was looking at him. Following the sensation, his gaze locked onto a young boy. The boy was barely ten. With his red hair and all-black dressing, the boy stuck out like a sore thumb in the crowd. After not sensing any malicious intent of sorts from the boy's gaze, Sakumo shifted his thought from that trivial matter. When will this end? Sakumo thought. Ever since he could remember, Hiruzen had made it a tradition of sorts, to make an appearance during the official rank promotion of shinobis in the leaf. He claimed that being the father of the Kanoha family enabled him to pass the will of fire to the next generations. In most of his appearances, especially the initial ones on a shinobi's life like the Genin and Chunin promotion, Hiruzen had to appear in the presence of the village's council member or any other dignitary like other Kages. The aforementioned council mainly consisted of clan heads. Sakumo being the head of the Hataki clan, was the latest victim. At first, he was not up for it, but as he was the only one available, he was mandated to. There was also the fact that a member from his clan was also participating in this promotion exam that Hiruzen used to strong-arm him into doing this. All of this was on a light note of course. Even the clan member participating, Hataki Hiro, was only his cousin's son. Trying to figure out their true familial connections would force one to draw it out in the sand. This was not strange as all shinobi clans had loose familial ties and were mainly bound together by their shared ideals and history. As they made their way to their designated seats, Kurama approached them. After reaching them, he bowed before saying, Lord Third, it is a pleasure to see you here. How is the exam faring on Yaza? Hiruzen asked. It is going on well. We have an increase in the number of students who passed the final two stages. The number is more than the average of the last five years. Yaza replied in glee. That is good to hear. Now, don't mind this old man and carry on with the exam. Yaza promptly did so. He returned to his post and a few minutes later, the taijutsu spars began. Although only 256 students remained, only a hundred would proceed to the next stage. The students were to potentially go through eight battles. The first round would be the normal winner stays. This would go on till the final match where the winner would be crowned. However, only the top 64 students would proceed to the round. Hence, the pressure was still on. Due to the numerous battles to be fought, the first two rounds were fought simultaneously. Since these were pre-genin students, with their still growing reserves, it did not take long before a quarter of the initial number remained. The first two battles were quite easy for the whole group except Nara Heiate. Today was just not his day. First, it was the fact that he was paired up with one Senju Kibo. Senju Kibo was among the top students for the three years he had been in the academy. He had managed to win the battle after a drawn-out bout. For his second battle, he was unfortunate to be paired up against Renjiro. Out of respect for his opponent, Renjiro did not hold back and quickly finished the match. Thus eliminating Nara Heiate. I am even surprised he managed to hold out for this long considering his lazy demeanor. Lazy would be a strong word, Heiate works smarter, not harder. The others, Aiko and Hiro managed to win their bouts until their fourth round, where they were both eliminated. For Renjiro, he steamrolled his way through to the final match where he tasted his first match. I don't know if he is just that good, or if the continuous spars caught up with me. Ah! I should stop making excuses, Hiro was just better than me. Hiro Hyuga was the student who beat Renjiro. Even with his Sharingan, he was too fast for Renjiro. If the fight allowed ninjutsu, then Renjiro was sure that he would get the better of him. The only takeaway was that the pure skill Renjiro witnessed from his was very informative. It also made him realize how far he still had to go if he was still losing taijutsu spars from academy students. Since they took the whole day to settle the taijutsu stage of the exam, they would proceed to the final stage, a ninjutsu test, the following day. In the ninjutsu stage of the assessment, the students were faced with a series of tasks designed to evaluate their mastery of fundamental techniques. The three academy jutsus, clone, transformation, and substitution, served as the baseline for their proficiency. Each student was expected to execute these techniques with precision, 
demonstrating a solid understanding of the basics. Additionally, the students were challenged to showcase their prowess in elemental jutsu. This portion of the assessment aimed to reveal their aptitude for manipulating chakra in alignment with natural elements. For the ninjutsu test, Renjiro did not see the need to go over the top and perform all the elemental jutsus he had learned ever since he came to this world. They were six after all and doing so would be quite the overkill. In most cases, quality is better than quantity. Renjiro opted to only perform the Great Fireball Jutsu as it was his most high-ranked elemental jutsu. Although it was a crank jutsu, it did not exactly wow the instructors as it had already been done by some of his Uchiha upperclassmen. But this was not Renjiro's goal, as he was sure he would get a better ranking regardless, due to his performances in the previous stages. As the last part of the promotion assessment, the students were free to return to their abodes after the ninjutsu test. Their scores would be tallied and they would receive their final grades the following day. This was because there would be a prize-giving ceremony where the Hokage would grace the occasion and award the top-performing students. The students were abuzz with anticipation as the upcoming prize-giving ceremony promised to be a momentous occasion. The Hokage himself would preside over the event, an indication of its significance. In addition to honoring the standout performers, the Hokage would play a pivotal role in a time-honored tradition, the awarding of forehead protectors to the newly graduated genins. Closer to noon, the ceremony finally began. Hiroshi Nagatomo, the academy head instructor, stood at the podium, welcoming the esteemed Hokage and initiating the proceedings. Hiruzen Sarutobi, the third Hokage, stepped forward, his presence commanding respect. With a regal demeanor, he began a heartfelt speech about the indomitable spirit of the village, the will of fire. Damn, he's good. It seems every opportunity he gets to speak to kids he takes to initiate his brainwashing. He must be really experienced in this. Renjiro remarked. However, there was a hint of respect in his voice. Respect not for the cause, but for the opportunistic quality of the Hokage. After his inspiring address, Hiruzen called forward the top three students of the promotion assessment. The lucky students were Hiro Hyuga, Inabi Aburame, and last but not least Renjiro Uzumaki. Congratulations young ones, you have shown us your exceptional abilities. I hope you will continue to strive for far higher heights, Hiruzen began after the three students joined him in the podium. As an award for your good work, I will allow you to ask of me anything. Of course, your demands should be reasonable. Hiruzen finished with a soft laugh. Being presented with such a choice, Renjiro was at first shocked by the Hokage's declaration. But when he took a moment to think about it, he came up with an idea that forced a smirk on his face. Since they would begin with the third student, Renjiro would be the first to place his demand. Without much fan service, Renjiro stepped forward and shamelessly said, Lord Third, I would like to be taught the Flying Thunder God technique. Renjiro said. Hiruzen was at a loss for words. He was completely stupefied. He was not the only one shocked. All of the adults were well aware of the second Hokage's technique and to think an academy student asked for it right out of the bat. Where the hell did he even get this idea from? Hiruzen thought as he glanced at Hiroshi, who was blushing. It was clear that he was experiencing second-hand embarrassment from Renjiro's actions. Fortunately luckily for Hiruzen, he did not take long to regain his composure and answered back, don't you think that you are too young to learn such a technique? Hiruzen was trying his best to defuse the situation. Outwardly denying the child his request would be bad for his image regardless of the child's outrageous demand. Therefore he needed the boy to concede on his own, or at least appear so. I have him where I wanted him. No, I am sure with your experience and guidance I can manage, Renjiro replied, not backing down. Hiruzen and I twitched but he countered, so, wouldn't guidance help you more than the technique? Renjiro appeared to be thinking about it for a moment before he answered, yes, it would Lord Hokage. Then would you be kind enough to give me lessons on Fuenjutsu? Should I do it? But he is still a child, I should probably get someone else to tutor him. Considering his background, I think I have just the right person to do it. With a resolute conclusion, Hiruzen had a soft laugh before replying, You see Renjiro, my duties make me busy but how would you like to have an experienced Fuenjutsu master to teach you? Well, that was easy. Renjiro was in no way an experienced negotiator in his previous life, but he still had some basic knowledge of the subject matter. He had only read up on the topic for conversational purposes but boy was he glad he did. All his experience, which was non-existent before this, could be summed up in three rules. The first one, of course, was to know what you want before negotiating. Renjiro knew that it would be a cold day in hell before the Hokage gave him the Flying Thunder God technique because he was not even a genin. Not to mention he had yet to make any contribution to the village. 
the second one was to strive to be innocent. In most cases, this trick helps others lower their guard around you. And this could help you punish someone for underestimating you. The third and final rule was aiming for a win-win situation. By utilizing all the above rules, conceding your earlier requests would give the other party the illusion of you settling for a more reasonable offer. That is what Renjiro wanted Hiruzen to feel. I would really love that, Lord Hokage, Renjiro answered. After finishing up with Renjiro, Hiruzen turned to the Hyuga and Aburame expecting them to name what they wanted. It seemed that Renjiro had started a trend and the Aburame asked for an advanced jutsu bordering on the forbidden extent. The Hyuga asked for chakra nature crystals for meditation. Almost everyone found this weird as he was from a shinobi clan full of resources, so why would he need it? With the ceremony reaching its zenith, the Hokage requested the academy instructors to distribute the coveted forehead protectors to the graduating students. This symbolic accessory marked the transition from an academy student to a full-fledged genin. The students, now officially recognized as genin, couldn't help but wear broad smiles that mirrored the pride they felt in their accomplishments. The academy ground echoed with a blend of cheers and applause as the young shinobi proudly donned their forehead protectors. It was a moment of triumph and the beginning of their individual journeys as shinobi, each destined to leave their mark on the legacy of the hidden leaf. Amidst the celebratory atmosphere, Renjiro's elation was palpable. The weight of the forehead protector resting against his brow served as a tangible validation of the relentless effort and dedication he had poured into his training. That's one step made. But the job is far from being complete. Renjiro muttered. A subtle yet profound sense of accomplishment settled within him, a silent acknowledgement of the hurdles he had overcome and the strides he had taken on his shinobi journey. After the celebrations, Ruji congratulated them on their accomplishments. This is just the beginning of your story. So don't be in a hurry and just take each day as it is. If you continue to work hard you might be the next Hokage. Nope. Minato is a different monster to even think of competing with. Renjiro thought as he bid farewell to his friends and headed home. The celebration spilled over to the next day as Renjiro was invited by Inabi and the trio's parents for a meal. Since Miwa was away on a mission, he did not see any reason not to accept the invite. Renjiro chuckled as he accepted the invitation, a wry smile playing on his lips. The prospect of a shared meal was doubly enticing for he was hiding a huge secret. Renjiro's huge dark secret was that he was a terrible cook. Renjiro's culinary escapades were nothing short of legendary. If one could distill chaos into a pot, it might have come close to his attempts at cooking. His misadventures often resulted in comically catastrophic outcomes. Once, a simple attempt at boiling water morphed into a smoke-filled extravaganza, reminiscent of ninja smoke bombs. Another time, an innocent stir-fry turned into a fiery spectacle that rivaled even the most enthusiastic jutsu displays. The only consistent element in his cooking was the unpredictability, you never quite knew what you were going to get, but you could be sure it would be a memorable experience, if not a tasteful one. I used to wonder why Naruto used to live on ramen cup day in and day out. Didn't know bro was just like me. Or am I just like him? But why can't I just be a decent cook? It must be this body, since before I came to this world, I was a decent cook. Yes, this body must have issues. Renjiro remarked. That is why it was a no-brainer to accept the invitation. Seated around a shared table, the Uchiha clan's elder members delicately intertwined the celebratory atmosphere with a sense of responsibility. The newfound status of Genin brought with it the expectation of shouldering clan duties. Inabi, Yashiro, and Tekka's parents conveyed the importance of active participation in clan meetings, a responsibility meant to foster a sense of unity and collaboration within the Uchiha community. Assurances were offered, emphasizing that the young genin need not bear burdens beyond their capacity but were encouraged to engage in the collective decisions that shaped the clan's path. Renjiro, amidst the camaraderie and familial warmth, absorbed both the flavors of the meal and the weight of his newfound responsibilities. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.